Good morning, everybody. This is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast, joined by Ileana Clone Rosa. And this morning, we are going to be doing a deep dive into all things Madeline Soto. What is going on with the investigation? Is her mom a person of interest? They've already arrested Stephen Stearns, her uh, purported stepfather, not her actual stepfather. But we're going to talk about everything that's going on with the case, our thoughts and opinions about whether or not Madeline's mom is going to be uh, implicated, uh, but you're going to want to stick around for this one. It's going to be a good one. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. We're going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat, feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. All right, let's get to work. So February 22nd, 2024, Madeline Soto celebrated, well, she didn't celebrate on that day. That was her actual 13th birthday. A few days later, she had her birthday party on February 25th. It was held at her mater maternal grandmother's house, Yolanda Zambrano. There was a couple of her friends in attendance and some family members. Stephen Michael Stearns was there. Jennifer, Madeline's mom, was not present because she was working. And at that point, Jennifer has stated in her interviews that she had saw Madeline off to bed. And that was the last time she had ever communicated or seen her daughter. That's her story. As the story goes, as it unfolded, the morning of February 26th, you get this ambiguous interview from Jennifer after Madeline had already gone missing. And her story was essentially, she kept on mixing up we and mm -hmm. he. And everybody's making a big deal of that. And as they properly should, because, you know, when I first heard that interview, I had thought, oh, she took her daughter to school. Yes, me too. And I was confused, like, okay, wait, your boyfriend took her to school. And it just took me a minute to register that was an, an inconsistency. Mm -hmm. So, but the story goes that they had uh, presented was that Jennifer's boyfriend took her to school at around 8.30 a.m. that morning. Didn't drop her off at the school, dropped her off maybe a half a block prior to approaching the school at this church in a parking lot, which I often would do with my high school aged daughter, who's like mm -hmm. 17 years old. Before she started driving to school, it was something that I would do, drop her off at a, well, there's like this residential area and I would do that because I avoid the traffic and because I got to go get to court and she gets to go to school and it's like a half a block, but she's also not 13. Like she would never do that at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that part of it didn't really strike me except that school didn't start that day until about 9 30. Mm -hmm. and so just putting on your detective hat i can understand not dropping off a child in front of their school directly in the school school parking lot because it gets really congested i've done that many times with my eldest but it an hour before school starts is usually pretty open and you could drive right up to the front of the school. And so already alarm bells should have been going off. There was a mention of surveillance footage on the part of Jennifer, who admittedly, she admitted she had never seen the actual footage of Jennifer in the parking lot of that school, but it but from her statement, and we're going to listen to her interview because I want to get your guys' thoughts about how you view her demeanor, the way that she was talking, because it was bizarre. And she gave a couple of interviews. The first one, you see her giving this interview, and her boyfriend is pacing back and forth behind her, like menacing behind her. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a second interview where she has these weird mannerisms where it's like she's bouncing around. When I first saw the video footage, I thought it was like a green screen, like because it's almost like somebody was shaking the camera, but she was like bouncing up and down and giving this like really neurotic, bizarre interview that was setting off a lot of red flags for all of the viewing public. 
And then, of course, there was Stevens' interview, and we all kind of, we, it's not really common, it's, it's not really a big surprise now at this point that he's been arrested. Uh, but going along with the story, here we are. Uh, she's saying she sees this video footage, or she didn't see it, but she heard about it, and she's making these pleas. Come to find out, as the police go further into their investigation, oh, but before we get into that, she had made mention that Madeline had left her cell phone at home. And so she decides to go through her phone and she goes and searching and she finds these posts or communications. It's not clear whether it was like a journal entry or whether she was texting other people. Maybe some of you folks um, have seen those text messages. I haven't been able to uncover them, but there was is basically on my 13th birthday, I'm going to disappear into the woods which was a bizarre thing for anybody to do. I'll tell you what, when I was like 11, I ran away from home once. You know where I ran? I ran to uh, Stater Brothers. Oh. <laughs> I was 11. Food in there? <laughs> yeah, well, because <laughs> I was hungry. It's like, okay, I don't have any money. What am I going to do? I'm going straight to Stater Brothers. And then, uh, well, I think I had a couple of bucks on me. I bought like a, like a pie, like one of those little <laughs> miniature pies. Yes. And then I went across the street to a Target. And then... Uh, I took some kind of food and went into like a dressing room and ate the food. Oh, God. <laughs> and then it was like a whole three hour adventure. And then I was just thinking, this is this is bullshit. I'm going back home. Oh, <laughs> but God. I can't. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get caught? No, I was a little thief at 11 years old. I think I think the statute of limitations is run on that yes. crime. <laughs> but yeah, as far as going into the woods, I would have lasted an hour or two before it was time for dinner. And it's, it's just not, you know, children have those thoughts. Sure. Going to the woods. Yeah. I could see children having those thoughts, but at 13 years old, she has a cell phone. Many have made a, a big deal about, well, she won't have her electronics. She won't have a, a PC. She won't have her cell phone. She won't have anywhere to charge her stuff. And it's not really the thing to do when you're 13 years old and 24, my pushback on that is maybe that was part of the adventure. Maybe uh, it was part of the thing that was, look, we've come to find out in the coming, in, in the, the preceding days that she, this young lady has undergone a torment unlike any of us could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And the speculation is there was a whole press conference yesterday. Okay. In that press conference, they didn't say a whole lot. And you know what that means, Ileana? It means that they are looking at a lot of different people. It's not limited to uh, Jennifer Soto, mom. They're looking at everybody, anybody that had contact. And for the images that were uncovered, that is beyond. That is just a level beyond for your own personal entertainment to the point where maybe these images and videos that were recovered were commercialized in some kind of underground CP ring, you know? And all, of course, all speculation. None of that has been confirmed, but that is the speculation. So, Madeline goes missing on the 26th. The same day that she goes missing, they call the cops at around 4.45 that same day, and she reports her missing, and then we go through this whole investigation. On the same day of February 26th, Stephen Stearns did a factory reset on his cell phone on accident. <laughs> the same day that she goes missing. Highly coincidental. Plausible. Is it plausible? I don't know. Have you ever done a factory reset on your phone? Only when I was going to turn it in. I've done... I've like done before one. Before exchanging it for a new one. But sure. That's it. I've done it once. Mm -hmm. once on accident, not on, well, it wasn't accidental. It was not on purpose is what I'll say. Cause it was like, I used to have on a cell phone that I had like a draw pattern thing to yes. unlock the phone. Mm -hmm. And then the screen was messed up. And so I couldn't draw the pattern and I couldn't enter like an alternate way to open the phone. And so it got to like, after like 20 unsuccessful mm -hmm. tries, like you have five more tries before you, there will be a factory reset. I was like, Oh shit. And then I'm like calling around. Is there anybody that could fix this? And nobody could fix it. And um, after I got to, I was just, well, I guess I'm, you know, let me just try it this way. I tried a number of different things. 
my big concern was I had pictures of like the birth of my children on that phone. I didn't want to lose them. Luckily they were in the cloud and so mm -hmm. they were recoverable, but it warned me like 20 different times that if we do a factory reset you're not recovering any of your stuff. And uh, so there was no accidental anything. You can't just accidentally press a button and expect a factory reset to happen. It gives you like five or a little bit. Yeah. Like a message is like, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, like, a this bunch of times. <laughs> you want to go back? Think about it. And I don't remember how many warnings there were, but there was a bunch. And mm -hmm. so there is no accidentally deleting stuff. And so the fact that he deleted all the stuff mm -hmm. on the 26th, the same day, then he talks to cops He gives this interview to law enforcement. A couple of days later, he was in custody because of what they had uncovered. And we're going to go over the arrest affidavit. And for all the soon-to-be criminals out there, erasing your phone doesn't work. Like, it's recoverable. Recoverable. Yeah. recoverable. So... Well, that is not only stored on your phone. Like, there's, mm -hmm. there's clouds now. Exactly. So I don't know why all these people think that, oh, yeah, I'm just going to erase it here. It's gone. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, and even if it's gone for your phone, all your phone has done is repurpose mm -hmm. that space to allow it to be recorded over. It's not fully gone. Exactly. And I've heard forensic data recoverers mm -hmm. tell me, and I've not, not done this myself, but you could factor reset a phone two or three or four times. I could still find your stuff. Mm -hmm. And and so they're you're right, you're not gonna you're not gonna get rid of that stuff. So Madeline Soto murder she her husband is murder suspect number one. Nobody's been charged with murder yet in this case. Not to say, of course it's coming. Of course it is coming. Oh, yes. And Stern is prime suspect number one. He's the last person known seeing uh, her. Now, his story was, I don't know, I dropped her off at 8.30, and then, you know, I saw her get out of the car, drove away. But they uncovered video footage at 8.19 a.m., contradicting his story, mm -hmm. that not only showed him, well, it shows him in the back of the apartment complex, Okay. And I haven't seen this footage, but the police have described it. And he's essentially discarding Madeline's school laptop. Oh, yes. A number of different items, just throwing it in the dumpster. And in that video footage, they say that they can see Madeline in there and she appears to be lifeless at that point. So the running theory of the case at this point is that she was probably already deceased mm -hmm. before she left anywhere that morning. And so... How much of that did mom know? She said she was at least alive that night when she wished her good night. And, and so that's the big question. There have been multiple law entities right now that are currently involved in the investigation. There's the prosecutor's office, there's the lawyers and house investigators, the medical examiner's office. They're all focused in, the work, or, well, not just on Stephen Stearns, but right now there's 60 counts of what amounts to uh, child abuse mm -hmm. on various levels. And they're all working to figure out how far does the tree branch off. And so when you hear a, an, an investigative press conference and they're just giving answers like, oh, yeah, investigation is ongoing, but I don't have anything new for you. And so, which is what happened yesterday, you know that everybody is being implicated and they're 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 being very careful not to let any information out that they know mm -hmm. because they got to bring people in for questioning and knowledge of the investigation obviously compromises the interrogation i'll tell you what there was evidence that was leaked oh yes that law enforcement was very upset about because it was basically the the location where madeline was found a picture had gotten out and law enforcement was very upset. There was like this whole well to do about how it should have never happened. It was sloppy investigative work and they don't believe it's going to compromise the, uh, the investigation, but still WTF, you know? Yeah. So that part of it has gotten out. The fact that we even know these things, you know, you got to believe that they're not integral, but the parts that we have questions about is all the stuff that they probably already know. And oh, I'll tell you what, yes. it's like, a in the Watts investigation, any investigation that you've ever been a part of or a criminal case you've been a part of, if they're bringing you in for questioning, they already have enough to know what you did. And when they bring you in, 
they're basically looking for inconsistent statements. They're trying to get a confession, obviously, for obvious reasons. They're, they're trying to get convictions, you know? Yes. So when I tell people that if you're going in for questioning, you give factual details and you give it once. And after that, you shut it down. You don't answer any questions. And here's the thing. You think that if you talk to them, you're going to get in their good graces and they're going to let you go. If they have enough to arrest you, they're going to do it anyway, regardless of whether or not you say anything. And if they think that you're the person that did something and you're not the person that did something, but they think that you are and you know, they're looking at you and they're bringing you in because they want more. They're looking for just one final thing. Mm -hmm. So if either they don't have enough at that point or they try to lure you in because they're going to arrest you at the station, either way, if they have enough to arrest you, they'll do it with or without your confession. That's true. Or statements or, or whatever you think. The confession just makes it easier for them. Oh, yeah. I mean, but, but not even because we just saw how Chad Doerman had his oh, confession yeah. uh, thrown out because of they failed to properly Mirandize. Mm. Either way. So the investigation as of right now is suggests that there's multiple suspects in the case. They're, they have not concluded so far that it's only Stephen Stearns. But for the murder or for the like pedophile well clearly for clearly for the pedophilia aspect yeah. of it yes i mean uh, m more times i will say most of the time whenever there's an allegation of that there's more people involved because in that type of case they tend to share of course the the material but in the murder it's just right now the mom and the boyfriend well right now well, nobody has been charged, but I guess the... If I'm reading into the... We already know the murder charge is coming. Yes. We know that. Yes. There's 60 counts of child Neglect. crimes. Mm -hmm. And the crimes that could come from that involve aiding and abetting, involve conspiracy to commit various atrocities. They want to know who knew what. Because... When they were there at the house interviewing Jennifer and Stephen, they noted that in the videos and pictures that they had recovered, they noticed the same bed sheets. Uh, there was the same like patterns of uh, uh, clothing. There, there was clearly stuff in that house that was present in those videos. So the crimes obviously occurred in the house, which is why the charge sterns. The question is, did Jennifer know about did it? Mom know, yeah. And if you're going conspiracy theory about it, not even conspiracy theory, is there like some underground CP ring out there? And it's, it's sickening possible. to think about, but people are into that stuff. It is very possible. Let's t I have a copy of the actual uh, arrest warrant. And just a warning, take a moment to consider our show sponsor, Aura Internet Security. If you have been following my Instagram or my Facebook, you would know that we have been attacked by hackers and the both of those accounts have been deleted, ripped off of the face of the earth. It happens. Hacking is a real thing that occurs. And let me tell you something else. Uh, data brokers will sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. And you might not believe it, but your full name, your email address, your home address, your health records, your relatives, your children, your spouse, all of it is out there. I am a lawyer. I do my own background checks. I pay good money for my background checks, but it's starting to get to the point where you could Google anybody's name and some kind of a secondary source of information, such as a birth date or email address or something, and you will find that you can Google all of this information. It's just out there for people to exploit. That's why um, I have decided to use Aura, the sponsor of today's video, on Aura shows me, they show me specifically which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. And I'll tell you what, I had them when I signed up for their services, they showed me there was three separate internet brokers that were selling my information that they automatically got rid of for me by taking the initiative to opt out of those uh, memberships. So cleaning up my information, cleaning up your information, and it only reduces the amount of spam that I get, it protects me from hackers that could use my information to help them access my social media accounts. Highlight, if you've been a follower of my Instagram or my TikTok, 
or well, not my TikTok, but my Facebook, you will know that that account, those accounts no longer exist. It had nothing to do with anything. I had a, a 20 year old Facebook account. It's completely gone because of hackers, spammers, whatever you want to call it. It's gone. So it protects me from that. It protects your social media accounts, your bank accounts, other sensitive information. Also, Aura does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. I get other features like uh, antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set it up. I did it, matter of fact, this morning. Um, it took me about a couple of minutes to get me all set up and protected. Um, and you get it all at a really easy, affordable price. Um, but beside that, you might already have some of these tools already, but just but not but not having aura is like is literally like leaving locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. People just walk right in and take all of your stuff. I value my privacy. I value yours. You can go right now to aura.com slash tilted lawyer. Um, to start your two-week free trial, no cost to you. It's going to be linked below to, in the description. Go in and sign up for your free 14-day trial and experience all of the protection that comes with Aura Internet Security. It's powered by inter artificial intelligence. You're not going to regret it. Go on, go on in and check them out. For all of you, this is going to get very graphic very fast. This is not a show uh, for children to be listening to. So I have a copy of the actual arrest warrant, emergency warrant request cover sheet, and this is from the Kissimmee Police Department. This is these are the the uh, charges, or this was the basis for the arrest essentially. And it goes on to say, officers of Kissimmee Police Department. Kissimmee. <laughs> Kiss, is, what is it? Kissimmee. K Kissimmee. Officers of, of Kissimmee Police Department are waiting what? to immediately, directly, instantly, and at once, without delay, proceed on this search warrant. And they check a box. The guy is located at the address, 2500 West Colonial Drive, Orlando, Florida. And these are the facts justifying it. So this is what they found. And it's heavily blacked out. Of course. But digitally appears the affiant, Detective Bryant Moore, ID 804, a sworn law enforcement officer, to wit, an officer uh, for the Kissimmee Police Department, who makes this affidavit and states under oath that affiant has probable cause to believe that certain laws have been violated, and these are the laws. Uh, on February 26, 2024, at approximately 20 hundred hours, uh, Blank was reporting missing by her father. The mother advised her daughter's stepfather, Stephen Stearns, picked her up. And by the way, uh, so many of you said that is not her stepfather, so they weren't married. Um, he was playing the role of stepfather. I don't know if he was making her call her stepfather or mom was doing that, but that's how they addressed him in the in the in the arrest warrant but essentially he was mom's boyfriend and if you wanted to come up with an appropriate name for him you could call him uh, madeline's tormentor and if you wanted to go a step further you could say a dead man walking as he sits with these charges in prison but i digress stephen stearns picked her up from home and dropped her off at hunter's creek middle school and they give the address on february 26 2024 the mother went then to pick up from school at dismissal and learned, and they, again, they're blanked out, never show to school. The assumption, of course, is that they're talking about Madeline. And, and an interview was conducted with blank Stephen Stearns, who advised he picked, I'm assuming they're meaning Madeline, up and dropped her off in front of Peace Unified Methodist Preschool, and they give the address, which was down the street from the school at 0840 hours. Hunters Creek Middle School begins class at 9.30, a license plate reader captured Stephen's vehicle with a Florida tag, and they give her tag, driving, and again, it's blanked out. So during the interview with Stephen, he provided consent to search his phone. However, he stated he accidentally performed a factory reset on his phone on February 26th, the same day Blank went missing. After an extensive canvas of the era and interviews with Blank's family and friends, it was unusual for Blank to be dropped off down the street from the school and not stay in communication with family and friends. Upon reviewing the contents of Stephen's phone, several images and videos were located which depicted Blank's breasts, vagina, and anal opening as the focal point of the pictures slash videos. There were also pictures and videos depicting as such, the files depict this performance of a child. Your affiant 
has probable cause to believe Stephen was in possession of material depicting, depicting the performance of a child. It should be noted the had distinct marking on it, which consisted of bright pinkish colored skin below the head of the penis until approximately a quarter of the length down the shaft of the penis. Several other pictures capturing this distinct pattern were observed on the phone. Further, as your fiend was reviewing the pictures and videos, I was observing several different places of clothing, pieces of clothing, to include patterned underwear, skirts, blankets, and sheets. Large section of this is um, blacked out. Based on the totality of the, cir of the circumstances, your fiend has probable cause to believe Stephen committed a battery. And then it goes on to uh, list his description, uh, signature on the warrant, and whatnot. And so... That is uh, the basis for which he was arrested. And look, those media uncovered on a phone to that degree, almost always, and when I say almost always, probably like 60% of the time mm -hmm. is for the purposes of distributing to other people. Yes. So you don't take those kinds of images because it's very dangerous to have that kind of be in possession of that kind of stuff unless you're profiting off it or some other thing. Most uh, people that are into uh, what Stevens did to Madeline don't film it. And so the, the fact that there was so much that was uncovered in such graphic detail and like it seems like she was posed in different ways to, to uh, I don't know, almost like fulfill specific genres. Correct. It's highly likely that there is distribution of ch uh, child afoot in this case. Obviously all occurring in the home. Now, I don't know what Jennifer Soto's work schedule is. And I don't know. Well, of course, nobody knows to the extent of which she knew or didn't know anything about this. But I've heard people in the comments basically state that, look, I'm, I'm a mom and I feel like I would just know if something was off. And being a dad, I don't know everything going on with my children, but I know when things are wrong. You know your children. I mean, you've raised them from. And, and so there's, there's, there's many different theories about this. Okay, so I have reserved judgment on Jennifer just because I don't know what is going on. There's one possibility which is she was also abused by Stephen. Now, there has been, I'll tell you what, there has been some speculation that Jennifer is currently housed in a mental health facility. I haven't seen that corroborated by anybody official. I've seen like TikTok videos referencing it. I've seen some people on YouTube make comment to that, but I haven't seen anything specifically tying that. That's all speculation, and I, I haven't confirmed it. She may or may not be. But if you were to be 5150 and admitted to a mental health facility, what would be one of the underlying reasons why that possibly would occur? What if you just found out that your child exactly. was murdered and a mental breakdown yeah, yes. <laughs> at the hands of your boyfriend yeah. and you just suspected nothing, you know, it happens all the time. Unfortunately, not everybody has that. I mean, not every parent has that, that instinct to be able to identify if somebody's something's going on with their child. Not everybody has that, I guess, six sense or sense or to be able to I don't know I, like there's people that you can tell that they're not really that aware of their surroundings and how people are changing yeah. even if it's their kid like I mean we see it all the time with the cases like yes. not every parent has that sense where they they can tell what is right or wrong for their child the same way i don't think they can tell if something's happening or affecting them well i mean i mean i'm not defending her but i can see how she could i mean if this guy was doing this while she was at work i could see how she could have missed it it's difficult for me to accept that because i'm a dad mm -hmm. and like my four-year-old 
when I could tell when like she's mm-hmm. bothered by something. Yes. It's like, oh, Oli, do you got a lot of things on your mind? <laughs> See, but you're very involved with them. I mean, I don't know the level of the relationship of this Jennifer with her daughter. There are some parents that, I mean, are not really good parents. And well, I mean, they're I, not that involved and they don't really pay attention. Like, there's a, a lady that was just convicted of life sentenced to life in prison you heard about the case where she went yes, to puerto rico and then mm-hmm. um, left her daughter there for like a week yeah 10 days in a playpen i think it was a 16 month old that is a sickening case i that don't have the stomach to cover that right now but me either and there's not much to cover she just oh she just left her there yeah there was some drama in the uh, sentencing hearing about not to get off topic mm-hmm. but you know she claimed to have mental health mm-hmm. issues and so and how it's it's a little bit easier to figure out when your 17 month old child is uh, disturbed because they cry. I was just yes. talking to Dominic about mm-hmm. this about how you have to develop a superhuman level of patience. Oh yes, uh, that you've never had before because, well, I mean things get a little squirrely when you're a first time parent, the first couple of months, and having to deal with uh, this new variable of mm-hmm. uh, gut wrenching crying for no reason or reasons that you can't identify. And tell me about it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And so, I mean, there's people that have done it and they're mm-hmm. veterans, but I don't know, Jennifer Soto, uh, as a mother, she's been her mom for 13 years. And mm-hmm. it's just hard for me to believe that a child would undergo that much trauma. I've seen children before and after sexual assaults to this degree. And they're, they are one thing before, and they are quite another after. Even if you're not empathic in that degree, even if you're not like fine-tuned to your child's emotional state, it's obvious when, you know, you have this like bubbly eight, nine, ten year old and this doc, the Madeline might have been like as young as eight years old before all this happened. And then all of a sudden they go mute or just obvious catatonic this this retreat to mid level was what I'll unprofessionally call it, where you're not bubbly anymore, you're not all that sad, you're just like emotionless. And uh, as the siren goes by, I hate those sirens. <laughs> I think it also depends on the age because I can see how, for example, in Madeline's uh, situation, mom could have attributed um, that change to she's going to her teenage years. And some teenagers, they change and they become like rebels or they don't want to talk anymore. I mean, it's fair. But know. like, what if it started at eight years old? Because that's what some of the investigation yes. is uncovering. Yes. This probably started happening as, as young as eight, eleven. Mm-hmm. If it was eleven, that's still not. You're you're still preteenish. Mm-hmm. I remember my when my daughter was eleven and twelve, and yeah, she, there was the obvious high school. Yes, <laughs> there's, there's <laughs> such a divide there, and they they don't want to hang out with you anymore. I used to take my daughter to Disneyland all the time, and there was a distinct moment where it was like no longer cool to go with dad. So, hey, you want to go to Disneyland? Well, who else is going to go? What do you mean? Just me and you. Well, could I invite so-and-so? And then it was like, yes. you know, done. You're going to the movies and it's no longer cool being seen with parents or talking yeah. a lot. I mean. I yeah. Know. So, but different. Oh, yes. Yes. It's hard for me to believe that something that traumatic would happen to a child and a parent not pick up with it that had no knowledge. I mean. To me, I can see it happening. Of course, that's not a, an excuse or for Jennifer or the mom. And, but I see it. I mean, I can see it definitely happening. Not every parent, unfortunately, is as involved and has a good perspective of what's happening with their child. Well, let us take it a step further. Let's. Okay, so mother was clearly working. I don't know what her hours were. Maybe she Mm -hmm. was stressed out. Maybe there's financial troubles. Maybe she was getting abused herself. Maybe she was in the realm of this catatonic state because of the abuse that she was undergoing. If he was doing that to Madeline, what might he have been doing to Jennifer? So again, I don't know the answer to these questions. I'm just throwing variables out Mm -hmm. there and there's a full on investigation going on. I'm, I'm trying to give this lady the benefit of the doubt. And, I'm not passing judgment on her until I I hear more evidence, but we're going to listen to some of her interviews. That's another thing. Like what I have, 
<laughs> what I have said regarding the like her not knowing mm. is completely separate from what I think about her after I saw her interviews. Like yeah. just based on the interviews, I have another opinion. But just well, based on if like she was living under the same roof, I don't think that's enough for her to completely know what was going on. But the interviews <laughs> something else. <laughs> well there's a lot of inconsistencies, clearly. Yes. Um the one speculation that I've heard is that maybe because in the one interview, remember, and we're going to watch it right now, she's giving this interview and you could see Steven in the background, like pacing back and forth as if he like was listening intently about what she was saying and like monitoring it and making sure she said the right thing. Maybe he gave her a story mm -hmm. about what happened to Madeline. She really didn't know. And so we just trying to recite what he told her to say. And she was getting confused over her words because she was reciting a story and, as opposed to recalling her memories. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. And, and then, of course, the other is, well, guilty conscience, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so, but let's, let's, let's listen to it. I think it's worth a listen. Um, for all of you, uh, let me know in your opinions. This is the first interview um, where she is contacted by Fox 35 Orlando. And uh, she um, is expounding about. Let's. Let's take a listen. So this is a, the first interview that Jennifer gave to Fox 35 Orlando, and everybody has a lot to say about it, but what do you guys think? Let's take a listen. To school, we dropped her off close to school, across the street from a church, which is very, it's right next to the school. She crossed the street and walked to school, what we thought walked to school. Um, my boyfriend who drove her to school drove away at that point. Um, it was seen on video footage that she hung out in the parking lot of the church for a few minutes and then got up and walked towards the school. But she never made it from that walk from, and that was around 9 a.m. when she got up. Uh, she never made it to school after that. Um, it's right next to the school. I don't know why she didn't make it. I don't know if something happened on her walk along the way or if she got taken, but she never made it. And that um, was the last anyone seen of her or heard from her? Yes. I went to pick her up after school and she wasn't there. So I started driving around, trying, maybe thinking she took a walk. Maybe she decided to walk to my mom's office, which is pretty close to the, the school as well drove around and I didn't see anything. I drove back to the school. The school was closed. I emailed one of her teachers. They confirmed that she was absent all day. At that point is when I called 911 because I realized something was truly wrong. You heard from like any of her friends? Has she been active on any social media? She hasn't been active on social media. None of her chats, none of her games. Uh, we did contact all her friends. None of them had seen her Monday or heard from her. Yeah, there's no update. Uh, and I have to ask this, and I know I, I hate doing it, but is she the type that would run away? Has this happened in the past or anything? Has she ever threatened to, to run away? Never. She's never, ever mentioned anything like this before, and she's not the type to want to do this. She did accidentally leave her phone on Monday, which is kind of normal for her. She's got ADHD and very forgetful. So she left her phone at home, so there's no way to trace her. They tried tracing her school laptop, but that's off, so it's not pinging to anything. Jen, what, what is your fear? I know you mentioned she's on games and stuff. Do you think she could have, like, met somebody and tried to meet up with them? From... She's open to us. She's open with us about, you know, if she's got a crush with anyone. And she told us she had a crush on someone at school. And I looked at their messages. Nothing was weird. I looked at all of her messages, all of her deleted messages. Nothing seemed weird. It didn't seem like she was talking to anyone. So I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like she may have been taken because this is not like her at all to just disappear and not tell us, not let us know where she's going or who she's with. Yeah. What? All right. Initial thoughts, Eliana. 
What about that stands out to you? First of all, without knowing who she was, if you told me, just listen to this and tell me what is the relationship of this person to the victim just based on how she's talking to her demeanor, I would have said maybe a neighbor. Like, mm. she shows, like, no emotion. And I know people react differently to different situations, but if my daughter is missing, I wouldn't be so relaxed. Like, she is in this interview just giving facts and information. Oh, yeah, like, she went to school and this and that. The other thing that kind of stood out is when the interviewer asked her about like running away yeah. and the mom just goes into the cell phone being left at home and that she's not traceable. Yeah. Like, and when I heard that, my first thought was like, okay, so that's what you guys were thinking when you left the phone at home that she couldn't be traced. Like, I don't, I just found it very weird. Like it, that was information that was extra. And to me, whenever you're giving me extra information, that I didn't ask for, it's you're guilty. You're covering. Well, it's because you're you're telling me a story yes. that you've rehearsed, and then you see Stephen here in the background, and he's just kind of like very closely monitoring. Mm -hmm. I mean, here, but there's like periods of where he's like going back and forth with it. I don't know. I've I've thought about this. Mm -hmm. I I know what my emotive state is in like a, a crisis. Yes, I get angry. And like angry to the point of like action, like the fight or flight. I'm a fighter. And then we go, I would be with law enforcement. Let's, let's start leading the investigation. Let's go on through all of this. Uh, but I wouldn't be sad. Mm -hmm. There's no time for that, but it would come out some, it would come out in anger. And um, with her again, the very flat affect, yes. which I try not to judge that because I see so many, so many people in these cases with that similar affect. Yes, it happens. When I see flat affect, I my mind turns to trauma, and then she's in a traumatic situation. But then, like you're right, she's giving us extra details that we didn't ask her for, which, right, telltale, telltale signs of a guilty conscience. When I tell my clients, you only answer the questions that they ask you. And there's multiple reasons for that, and one of them is because if you start rehearsing a yes. story and then you tell the story that you rehearsed and they're going to be, well, you're going to be pointing them into your direction when they're looking for persons of guilt. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. And the, the speculation most popular is, is that Stephen perhaps fed her a story to explain why Madeline was missing. And she's trying to basically repeat it and she's mixing up the, you know, the we and the he and, the we and the he. I don't know. And a lot of her stuff is confusing. And mm -hmm. when I first heard this, I didn't know if I, I thought that she was the one that took her to school. Me too. And it's like, oh, wait, Steven did. And, and so that part of it was, was startling. Am I missing anything else? What, what are you getting this. from law enforcement? Are, I mean, are they actively searching for her what mother's intuition telling you right now? Is your mother's intuition telling you? been taken her? against her will. I do think so, yes. As a mom, you know, what is your, what's your mother's intuition telling you right now? I'm trying to hope for the best, but I'm just, I'm scared for her. I want her to be okay. I want her to be safe. I don't want, to, I don't want her to come back harmed. No tears. I, I just, I just want her back. Whatever that means. Just, I just want her back. Are you getting any updates from law enforcement? She's not I mean, wiping tears. Yes, they're searching that small area. You see that she's wiping. She, she, if you're not, if you're listening to the podcast, mm -hmm. she's wiping her face with like a napkin, but I don't see any tears coming down from her face. Mm -hmm. And so we just mentioned one of the signs you start giving extra details. Another one is forced emotion. Like a, you're, you're filming a script. I don't know if you can recall. Have you ever seen the movie? Have you ever seen the original Willy Wonka movie? No. Eliana. I know. Not the, I haven't seen the original or the new one. They, they're they just creepy. Like those, the little, what is it called? Well, there's a, the Oompa Loompas. The Dominic, Oompa Loompas. Have, you, have you seen that movie? Yeah. The, the original one, 1973 one. So there's this very startling moment in that movie where it looks like they're filming a different movie. 
honestly. It's about Charlene the Chocolate Factory, and it's supposed to be this kid's movie. And, like, in the middle of it, they cut to the scene where this lady is trying to negotiate with the kidnappers. Somebody kidnapped her husband. And what's the ransom? She's like, I will give him anything. I'll do anything I want. Hey, Dominic, this is, an, this is a quote with an insertable moment. <laughs> Matter of fact, let me see if I could just find that real quick. You'll see what I mean. It's instructive to watch. Willy Wonka husband hostage. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So you, you just mentioned Willy Wonka mm -hmm. and you're talking about there are, yeah, it's about Oompa Loompas and chocolate and candy and kids. But then in the middle of all of that, there's this weird ass effing scene. I'm sorry, Mrs. Curtis. Doesn't seem to be anything in his papers to give us a clue. They kidnapped my husband 12 hours ago. When are we going to hear from them? What do they want? Try to stay calm. They did it for ransom. All we can do is wait to hear their demands. I'll give them anything. Anything they want. All I want is to have Harold back. All right, so she gives like this really forced, anything he wants, Harold back and, you know, whatever. It's a, it's like a, they're filming a different movie. It's like, what is this? And then at the end of it, she says, well, they want your Wonka bars. And then she's like, well. What did they ask for? Whatever it is, they can have it. They want your case of Wonka bars. <laughs> Miss Curtis, did you hear me? It's your husband's life or your case of Wonka bars. How long will it give me to think it over? <laughs> My only point in bringing up that scene is because, um, when somebody, I feel like they're forcing emotions, they'll have that energy, you know? Totally over the top. It's like, Jesus, lady. You know, what was yes. that? That scene has always bothered me since I was a kid. Like, who is this effing lady? But if you think about how you think you are to be perceived in an emotional moment, you'll go to an extreme. And so her act of forcing a cry in this moment, and Stephen does the same thing. He does the exact same thing. Yes. Uh, the act of forcing a cry is specifically an act of performing because you're trying to convince your audience that, uh, like, this lady was so distraught over her husband, but she'll trade him in for some Wonka bars. She has to pretend like she is distraught over her husband. I don't want to say pretend. I don't know. We're, we haven't passed guilt or anything. But you'll see in the Stearns interview... But let me continue Maria, with this. But have they gotten any hits on any scent or anything like that? They haven't let me know anything. They haven't updated me since I spoke to them this morning. I've contacted them to get some information or to give them some lead. If someone's taken her and they're trying to take her just to show her face, just to make sure, you know, she's not being. All right. So you're right. W watching this, watching this video again, and I've watched this now a couple of times, but watching it now right here with you. With my narrative of the Willy Wonka scene, I feel like she's looking more and more, it's more and more plausible that she has knowledge of yes. something. And then when she said, I just hope that she returns whatever that means. Like she says that. Does she say whatever that means? Yes. Like. I missed that part of it. Let me go back. I hope she returns whatever that means. To run away. Never. She's never, ever mentioned anything like this before. And she's not the type to want to do this. She did accidentally leave her phone on. All right, I'm not going to try to so It's a little bit for when they when she starts with the emotion. Oh, OK. She says that I just want her back, whatever that means, like alive or dead. Like I'm trying to hope for the best, but. I'm just I'm scared for her. I want her to be okay. I want her to be safe. I don't want, to, I don't want her to come back harmed. I, I just, I just want her back. Whatever that means. Just, I just want her back. Yeah, that is kind of odd. Yes. Phrasing, isn't it? I mean, some people, I do it all the time because of the language. I, yeah. do, I say some weird things, but like, whatever that means to me that was like okay so alive or dead like I, do, do you want just this to end like well she doesn't sound like english is her second language i feel like english is her primary 
I don't know. How I don't long. know. But she has said some weird things that make, makes me think that she might have. I mean, she might have been in the United States for a long time, but I don't yeah. know if she mainly communicates in English all the time. I don't know. For all of you that didn't know, English is Ileana's second language. I and so, think it's kind of obvious. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. She messes up phrasing all the time. Yes. And it depends if I, who I have been talking to before coming to the podcast. <laughs> if I have been talking to somebody in Spanish for a long time, it takes me a little bit, a little while to kind of like go into English. And that's where I, I start messing up. <laughs> So let's let's take a look at the second interview and the second one. In this interview, there was a portion of it where some people like say she give like she gives like this weird smirk on her face. Like you're literally mm -hmm. talking about your missing daughter and like you're laughing mm -hmm. or smirking or smiling at the camera. And I thought it, were, it sounded like a bird. It turns out it's like oh, a dog feeder. Yes. Yes. I remember seeing that interview. I think it's a parrot in the background. That's what I thought. Apparently it's a dog feeder. A dog feeder? Well, in the comments, people got mad. Like somebody even said, I, f I, "I find this information highly sp suspect if the guy doesn't even know that that was a dog feeder and not a bird." Well, it's, the, it's <laughs> you know, talking like, in Spanish. Well, I didn't know that. It sounded like a parrot to me. It just sounded like a yes, bird. Yes, it sounded like a parrot repeating Spanish phrases. Well, you'll hear it again. Apparently, it is actually a, a dog feeder with a pre-recorded voice. Oh. Some have said that it's Madeline's vo voice in there. I've heard other people say that it's uh, Jennifer's voice. Well, it it doesn't matter. But yeah, let's let's listen to this into the second. Mm -hmm. So this one is more mm -hmm. bizarre because she has this weird bounce that she's doing. Mm -hmm. Steven's not behind her, but he's clearly there in the room because they, they talked to him right afterwards. And you can see how they have this similar forced emotion in the interview. Let's listen to this one. Oh, did I screw that up again? There it goes. Okay. So the first question is if I can have your first, your last name, and spell them both out for me. Okay. Jennifer Soto, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-O-T-O. -E -E Mother. Mother. Jennifer, tell me how you feel right now. I feel like I can't breathe. All I keep thinking about is, where is she? Is she safe? Is she okay? But we're, we're all a wreck. My entire family is a mess. We're just so worried. When did you first realize, or when did you file a missing report? We filed a missing report. Uh, we called the police at like 4.45 uh, yesterday, 4.45 p.m. But she actually went missing early that morning, around between 8.45 and 9 o'clock in the morning, she went missing. We had dropped her off close to the school. She wanted to walk the rest of the way. Sorry. That little smirk. This is what everybody talks about. What is it saying in Spanish, Eliana? Um, well, now I can't really listen to it, but I know it says hola, and when I listen to it, everything was in Spanish. Hmm. Go back, I, don't, I don't know if it's... I'm going to listen to it again. I heard, I heard in English, come get your food. No, but I, well, when I listened to it yesterday, I remember like it was all in Spanish. I just can't tell right now with the, no, I don't know why it, it oh. sounds like a little bit. Well, muffled. maybe it's because you're, you're, you're being exposed to my gringo voice <laughs> that the Spanish has become muddled, <laughs> but it's not important what it is, but mm -hmm. I don't know if that, that doesn't sound to me like Madeline, if it is. No, but now it makes sense that it's a feeder not 
because you can hear the food coming out. Yeah. Like, and also because she, it seems to be that she knows when it's going to stop. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's clearly like this automated thing. Yes. But she gives this smirk, uh, mm -hmm. and people were writing into that, and I, I, I was not ready to pass judgment on a smirk. But, well, when I listened to this interview, when I thought it was a parrot, mm. um, yes, I did notice this smirk. What I found, I don't know. I mean, I have pets, and whenever I'm in a stressful situation, and something like that happens, I wouldn't smirk. I think I would have been annoyed that. <laughs> I'm being interrupted by that thing. Not really. But would it have been like you're annoyed, like the annoyed smirk, like the uh, the evil no. smirk that uh, I would have been annoyed, annoyed like mad, <laughs> like <laughs> not smirking, not smiling. Yeah, I would have if somebody was around me, I would have been like, please shut that thing off. Like, I don't know. Well, let's continue with this interview because I want to get to the part where we get to Steven and you'll see the difference between the two spoke about her birthday party. She had a birthday party on Sunday. That balance really uh, bothers me. She had me. a great time. Uh, like I she's on speed or something. Working, but she had an amazing time. She was so happy with all her gifts. I, I told her good night and yeah, that was it. I, I, I was the one who took her to school in the morning. That was my partner. But yeah. 13. She's 13 years old. Yeah. 13, Madeline. 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 What are you thinking right now? In my heart, I feel like somebody took her. This isn't like her to just pick up and run away or just not go to school. you think friends the friends parents you've contacted and everyone. went through every single person everyone that we know that she knows we've contacted them all reached out to them the parents have gone out to search and look for her as well and we haven't come up with anything yet i've seen a lot of posts on uh, facebook so that, let's let's take a look at steven so he gives this interview and you, there's the forced emotion out of this guy he's completely like I don't know. I don't know if I would call it just overacting or whatnot, but he's, he really starts trying to put it on for the camera. Let's take a listen to him. First question is if I can get your first and last name and spell them both out for me. Stephen Stearns, S-T-E-P-H-A-N, S-T-E-R-N-S. All right, so Stephen, you seem very emotional right now. Explain to us. I dropped her off. Everything looked fine when I drove away. So last time we saw her. What were the conversations that y'all had in the car when you dropped her off? Not much. She was asleep for most of the way. Told her have a good day at school when she got out. I love her. She said thanks. Love you too. That was it. And so where, where, where do you think she could possibly be? I mean, this isn't, as I was told, this isn't normal behavior. This is not normal behavior. She's not the type that would just run off. We don't know where she can be. We're scared. We just want her home. Are you, in a sense, blaming yourself? It's hard not to. Why? I dropped her off early. I could have waited longer. She looked okay. She was walking towards the school when I saw her. It was like any other day, so I went on with my day. So when a man, to me, when they speak in that whiny, like, crying voice the entire time, without deviation, it's, it's a put-on. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously these guys have already been arrested, but look at his eyes. There's not a single tear in there. And another thing is that the interviewer has, has asked him twice, how are you feeling? And instead of saying how he feels... He just starts giving like the facts of the case, like I drop her off, yeah, and like he's not saying how he's feeling. He's trying to show, of course, with the tears and all that, but he's not answering the question. Yeah, and so what's striking about this is because we know that Stephen is the prime mm -hmm. suspect, 
But how much different was Jennifer in all of that? The only difference really was she had this weird bounce. Yeah, that could be that she's sitting and maybe she's doing this. And that makes you... Yeah, but it, it just... It, it, nervous. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she was nervous. The nervous, a leg shaking. But what she's saying, they almost mirror each other. Yes. Like you could like counterimpose them one over another. I bet you like they'd have like the same mm -hmm. speech patterns, mannerisms yes. and all. Uh, and uh, the same crying affect, both of them with dry eyes. Uh, she was a little more convincing, but only because she has a higher pitched voice. But I wasn't convinced by that. I mean, she was, mm -hmm. she was not crying. She was putting it on. And then Stephen, um, well, he's doing this. It's hard not to blame myself. What has the conversation been with Jen since? <sighs> She's been very, a lot stronger than me. She's been holding it together really well. But it just keeps coming in waves. This reality keeps hitting. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. Just, Wiping his tears that are so non-existent. Cool. Have you, like, literally put boots on the ground, went out? Yeah, I even went out with the cops where I had dropped her off. And we looked all up and down the road, all along the communities, and there was nothing helpful. None of the cameras were pointing the street. Nothing, which in 2024 was surprising. The church across the street had some cameras and they mentioned seeing her waiting around in the parking lot for a while before moving on. And, uh, which, where did that footage come from? That footage um, does not exist. Exactly. Because she was already gone. And so where are they getting this story about the footage from? I haven't been able to corroborate where that footage story came from they're the you, only ones mentioning that footage well yeah jennifer said that yeah there's footage from a church mm -hmm. and that she had never seen but it, it showed she described what this guy said exactly. and so i'm wondering if he was the one that tried to put that on but it was like it's like the stupidest thing to do why would you make up surveillance footage they're going to figure out that doesn't, that doesn't exist, exist. <laughs> like in a couple of minutes it's you know and so it's strange that that would be the move. So here's their plan. So they're going into all of this. Think about the uh, thing that they found on the phone about yes. you know, disappearing in the woods. They found her body in a wooded area. They found he was seen, Stephen was seen at the spot where Madeline was found because he was changing a flat tire or something like that. Oh, they didn't uh, know that. Yeah, and, and I'll get into some of the more some of the timelines mm -hmm. that come out from the the press releases so far. But they found him. He was arrested on the twenty sixth. There's some really great video about some lady yelling at him as he's arrested. Let's see if we can find it. Stephen Stearns arrested. Is this the one? Oh yeah. So this is him being arrested. As he gets out of the car, this lady just starts yelling at him. I'm assuming that she works for Fox 35 Orlando. Did you hurt her? Are you a pedophile? What's on your cell phone? Why aren't you talking to investigators? Where was Maddie last seen? Why aren't you helping her mother and her family? This is a little girl. Help them find Maddie. Where is Maddie? What is, where is she? What did you do with her? Tell us something. He's not gonna say anything. And then I heard, or I read today that he stopped cooperating. Oh yeah, for sure. He's got an attorney now, so. Mm -hmm. He's, he's not going to say anything ever again. He's not going to speak at his trial. I bet you he takes it to trial, though. Piece of shit. And Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, he hasn't been charged with murder. I mean, he had his arraignment on the 2nd March. Attorney gets in. He's He didn't even enter a, a not guilty plea. Attorney did it for him. Yeah. Waived his appearance. He knows the charges. Waived reading and advisements. Enter not guilty plea. Done. And so he's never going to say anything again. He's a dead man walking. 100%. If he's convicted on all 60 counts, he's never getting out of prison. 
the murder charges are forthcoming, and you can't last very long on in prison with those kinds of charges. Do you know who? Uh, there was that gymnast Nasser. Oh yes. You heard about him? Yes. Uh, they molested all of those girls. He's convicted. Yes. He has been having a rough time of it. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know the specifics, but there was a story not too long ago where he was getting roughed up in prison and like just having a really bad time uh, with he's this still guy. Alive? Oh, he's still alive. Yeah. But he's not doing very well. No, I can imagine. I, I For some reason, I thought he either, I, I don't know what this case is, he either had been killed or he killed himself, but I guess. Yeah, he hasn't done either of those things. He's a little coward. Nasser or Steven? Nasser. Well, Steven too, but Nasser, I, I just remember his interviews and all that. It, it, he made me really mad. <laughs> yeah, well, Nasser is still alive and well. I mean, he's not well, but he's alive. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll, for how much longer is anybody's guess? But I hope he lives a really long time. Um, as it pertains to Stephen, so let's go over some of this timeline with law enforcement. Uh, we've made it this far. Uh, let me just get to my point in the notes. All right. So. Has mom been interviewed after he was arrested? So that's the thing. I haven't corroborated this. The, the belief that she's sitting in a mental health hospital because law enforcement seems to indicate as of yesterday that mom is cooperating. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously they didn't talk about what they've talked about, but if she is cooperating, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what level, but they say that they're in communication. Okay. So they're, they're fact finding, mm -hmm. keeping eyes close on her. They know where she's at. She's not missing to them. And so, on March 1st, they held a vigil uh, for Madeline's body. It, her body was, well, her body was found in the woods mm -hmm. uh, during a coordinated search in the area off Hickory Tree Road. Body was found at 4.30 p.m. by Osceola County Sheriff's Office. Uh, search teams in a wooded area off of Hickory. Uh, the Orange County Sheriff's Office did an update. There was a vigil that was held. People had dropped off flowers, rosaries, and stuffed animals near the location, and that's what really pissed off law enforcement because there was this, it was a leaked photo. Mm -hmm. They just disclosed the area where the, uh, where the uh, victim was found. And so if it wasn't Steven and it was some other person, which there's no reason to think that there was, but what if, you know, they didn't have the prime suspect and they had to interrogate him on that. And now all that information is out there. It could compromise. Now they said they don't think it could compromise it, now, because I'm assuming that Stephen's their guy. Mm -hmm. But it was an Instagram account for Osceola County Sheriff Marco Lopez. He posted a confidential crime scene photo. Uh, and like it was Kobe Bryant. <laughs> accidentally shared with the public. And the they they basically said how that... Do you, how do you accidentally share well, he did it on, on purpose. Instagram? <laughs> he just didn't know it was a bad thing to do because he wasn't thinking, you know. But he shared another photograph on... Her personal Facebook account, it showed her posing with Stearns as he was walking out of a door at the county jail in the morning. She got in a lot of trouble for that. On March 5th, Jen Soto, there's a statement that was, well, the first time Jennifer Soto gave an interview to law enforcement, it didn't line up with what investigators knew. Uh, and they showed that Jennifer told deputies on February 26 that she saw her daughter getting dressed for school at 8 a.m. on Monday, and then Stearns took her to school. Well, the problem with that is they have her lifeless body in the car at 8.19 a.m. So if she was not alive at 8 a.m., she's telling the cops that. Now, all of a sudden, her story is starting to crack. Yes. So between 8 and 19 a.m., he's in the back of the apartment complex. He's throwing clothes into the dumpster. If she's alive, that means that the death would have occurred between in the 20 minute span between then. Uh, that's a tight, that's a tight squeeze. Yes, it is. And furthermore, um, when they do the forensics of this in the autopsy, they're going to be able to figure out pretty quickly what the time of death when? was. And if that story doesn't corroborate what she said, now what are we doing here, Jennifer? Yes. What's the story? So right now, uh, of course she's a suspect. They've been knowing, they've, they've known about this discrepancy for a few weeks now. There was an update on March 6th. Kiss Me Please, they, they updated. They talked about a public memorial service that was held. 
the private memorial service said on March 6, our precious Maddie was laid to rest in a private service surrounded by friend, family and close friends. They opened up a GoFundMe. So on March 12th, they filed 60 new charges in the Soto case against Stephen Stearns. And we've talked about those. And in an article said basically the state office on Tuesday filed 60 new criminal charges against Stephen Stearns the prime suspect in the disappearance and death of Madeline Soto, a 13-year-old girl whose body was found in Osceola County after she was thought to be missing for a week. Stearns has not yet been charged for Soto's death as of Tuesday. Stearns, who was the boyfriend of Madeline Soto's mother, Jennifer Soto, has been charged with eight counts of sexual battery of a child under 12, five counts of sexual battery with a child aged 12 to 18, seven counts of lewd and lascivious molestation and 40 counts of unlawful possession of materials depicting sexual performance of a child turn to more images um and i'd imagine if they are really are investigating whether or not there is a cp ring going on they would not have charged him with that yet mm-hmm. no need they got enough to keep him there forever um they will charge him later in yes. the investigation and then they say we appreciate the efforts of our partners and the state attorney's office in assisting with seeking justice for Madeline. And then it goes on and on. Later that date, there was an arraignment. It was set for April second at eight thirty. There was an interview that day of Madeline's grandmother Yolanda Zambrano. There was another Zambrano interview later that day. She gave a couple of different interviews. Um, the charging documents. Let me see if I could, if there's anything additional that we haven't already discussed. On March 14th, there was a notice of a pretrial hearing and a trial date and unified pretrial order. There was a jury trial set for May 13th. There's no chance there's going to be a jury trial on May 13th, but they set the initial date in the Department 4F for Judge Keith Kirsten. There was a pretrial set for April 24th and then... St- there was an article about it. The prime suspect in the disappearance and death of Madeline Soto, the 13-year-old girl who was last seen on February 26th, is scheduled to appear in Osceola County Court for a jury trial on the morning of May 13th. Stearns, the boyfriend of Madeline Soto, was scheduled for an arraignment on April 2nd, but that has been waived, as we talked about. So they waived it. What's likely to happen is at that pre-trial hearing is everything's going to get continued. It's going to be time waivers issued, and the investigation is going to continue. And I'd imagine that more charges are going to be added, yes. not just related to the murder, but it may be for the distribution and uh, sale of CP materials mm-hmm. to other people. And then you might see other people charged, maybe Soto, maybe other people that we haven't even talked about yet. So all of those things are up for review. So that is pretty much everything that we know about the case right now. It's it's not a, It's not a terrible... It's not it's not a ton of information. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of speculation going forth right now. The unanswered questions, obviously, is what is Jennifer Soto's involvement here? And it's starting to get really suspicious when she's talking about seeing Madeline get dressed at 8 a.m. Because remember in a a prior interview, she said the last time I saw her was when I wished her good night on Well, the night before her murder. (laughs) Yeah, and now her story's starting to change. So multiple different reasons for that. What do you make of it all, Eliana? What do you think? So Jennifer Soto's coming to your office and she wants representation because she thinks that she's about to get charged with something. What are you telling her? I don't do criminal cases. Mm. (laughs) Well, let's just pretend (laughs) that you have to because you were a public defender. What what do you tell this lady? I mean, I will tell her not to say a thing to the to the police. Yeah. But I don't know. I Well, there was one question from our commenters. <laughs> it was a, a a nice lady in Australia. I th- I want to say that she was in Australia, but she had asked the question how do you as an attorney represent somebody that you know is guilty of a crime, essentially? Mm-hmm. You know, this the common one that we always... Well, focus, of course, on the law, not pass any judgment on the person. I think the us attorneys, after going through law school, we kind of learn how to separate, like, the emotions and the 
and the law. And mm. at least to me, it just becomes like a little puzzle that I need to figure out trying to use the law in my favor to, of course, defend this person. But I don't necessarily focus on what they did. Of course, there's limits. There's certain things that people do that I wouldn't be able to defend, especially if it has to do with a child, I think, now yeah. that I am a mom. But I think that's how attorneys are able to defend uh, guilty people. I've told you the many times about the story about that one time where I was working for a law firm and I had to represent uh, this guy that was accused of uh, sexual assault of his stepdaughter. Um, he had gotten her pregnant when she was like 14 or 15, forced her to get a marriage and blamed it on her boyfriend. And then he gave her an STD when she was 17. And then on a pretext phone call, she's asking him, why did she do why did he do these things to me? And then he was apologizing for it, essentially admitting to it. Yes. And on the basis of that, the counts that he was facing, life in prison. But the DA decided to offer him a deal of, if you plead guilty, we'll give you 31 years. I think the guy was 53 at the time. So he was going to be a very old man if he saw any, you know, by the time he got out, if he's ever released at all. Yes. If he survived that sentence. And I remember speaking with him at the hearing, telling him about the uh, the deal. And then he asked, like, I don't understand. What I did was not that bad. There's people in here that have done worse. And, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, trying to contain my anger. Yes. <laughs> and it's, I, I told him, hey, look, look, look. They got you on, on, on audio recording admitting to the crimes. And if a jury hears that, they're going to hate you. And you're going to get convicted. And you're going to sit here for the rest of your life if not worse. And so if you ever want a chance, I highly recommend you take the deal. And if not, it's up to you. It's hard. And he ended up taking the deal and I pled him guilty. And then I drove home and I slept uh, like a baby that night. <laughs> that guy's exactly where he belongs. Mm -hmm. And honestly, he should get a lot worse. Yeah. I've represented people like that. That's probably the worst that I've ever took into a final resolution. I've represented murder suspects before in the pre-investigation stages. And I've, I've told you before about that one case where I had where they lured this kid about Dominic's age. Hey, Dominic, if anybody ever lures you to a house or says, hey, come to this house up in rural, you know, wherever, some rural town to some house where there's miles between anything else because you're going to have a threesome with uh, this girl and some other girl, uh, just know that something is up. <laughs> so they, heads up. <laughs> yeah, they, they lured this guy, this this guy. It, it, is, it was one of those cases that stick with you. I, I had to go through all of his cell phone. He was deceased. And I had went through all of his cell phone records. I saw pictures of him with his daughter. And, you know, she was a baby at the time. And just this regular, normal, stupid kid. There's all these images of him on dating profiles and stuff he was sending other girls and girls were sending him and then of course the ones that lured him in mm -hmm. just a normal kid man stupid kid naive kid but just a kid and uh, they lured him to this place and there was a couple of guys waiting for him as soon as he stepped into the door with a baseball bat and an axe and the murder scene was so horrific i mean the the living room was drenched in blood it was seeping into outside of the walls. It was going into the kitchen. They took his body and they tried to clean up as best they could. And they stuck him in a fire pit and tried to cremate him. But, but obviously that's not how that works. And then they stole his car and then they sold it to somebody a couple of days later. And I'm talking to the guy. He was one telling me that one he's of innocent. The suspects? Yeah. Uh, one of the suspects. And, who, as he was sitting in jail, and he was swearing up and down of his innocence. I'm like, well, just so you know, this is the evidence that I know that they have, and I went through all of it. And then he's he's looking at me with soulless eyes, just the eyes of a killer, stone cold killer. Like his whole demeanor changed. He's like, ah, well, I guess I'm not going anywhere. And then that was the last I've ever seen of him. I just, I. I I told him that, well, you got an uphill battle, buddy, because mm -hmm. they got all this evidence against you. Next to come is probably DNA confirmation. And, <coughs> well, he didn't hire our office. And mm -hmm. so I never talked to him again. But, yeah, 
How does an attorney deal with representing somebody like Stephen Stearns? You separate, you, you have to understand the objective. Mm-hmm. You're not there to claim that he's innocent. Exactly. You're not there to lie to anybody. Mm-hmm. He's, he did this. Uh, the, the guy that was representing the, the, the lady that left her daughter there to starve to death as she vacationed in Puerto Rico got up mm-hmm. and on in mitigating and when they're doing the death, uh, the sentencing, the sentencing. hearing, mm-hmm. he gets up and just basically says she's a piece of shit. She's like the worst parent you could ever imagine. I'm not here to defend anything she did. She What she did is the most horrific of all. Like he's not there to lie to anybody. Like, look, um, all you're really there to do is preserve their rights. Exactly. We're all on the same team. You know, mm-hmm. he did this. And so if you want to consider something less than life or uh, a death, and these are the mitigating factors, and you just list them. Yes. And then the judge is going to make the call anyway. So that's all. But, yeah, it's difficult. It's something that you have to do, and you really just have to turn off your emotions to it mm-hmm. and focus on the law and your objective. That's it. And just because you defend somebody does not mean that you believe that they're completely innocent yeah. or that they're a good person. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody like, deserves, like, the rights to be preserved, of course, a good defense and due process. It doesn't matter what you did. I know there's people that believe that they shouldn't, but... Well, yeah. <laughs> until they're in that scenario exactly. and maybe they've been falsely accused and exactly. all of a sudden they want all of the rights. And that's why. And I've, I've, I have represented people that I 100% believe are innocent and I fought hard for them mm-hmm. people. And I've won trials and jury trials and gone through down that whole role about whether if I, if I lose this case, this guy's going to end up spending the next 18 years in prison. And so I can't because I, of my genuine belief of his innocence. You know, I fought hard for him. And we got the result. And there's also been a time where I believe my guy was innocent. He was charged of uh, sexual molestation charges involving children. Um, he was convicted and sentenced to six years. Um, I believed in his innocence. Uh, but that kind of unraveled at trial because the witnesses that we had had basically met during the trial. So here's what happened. So I had a trial. I was in the middle of a jury trial. My client was out on bond, and in the midst of trial, he met up. We were like on day three of trial. It was a four-day trial. The night before she testified, they literally met at his house to go over what she was going to say. And as soon as that came out, uh, the jury's like, no, no. I didn't know that was going to happen. And, well, the guy, they found the guy guilty. And so, yeah. Before we move on, I don't know, have I ever told you the first time that I visited, I did a, a jail visit? No, you have not. <laughs> what happened? It was here, well, not here. It was in Riverside, the jail that is in downtown. And this guy was accused of molesting a child. I went in, of course, with my previous bus, and we sat down in that little room where you see have the the clear um, mm-hmm. glass yep and whenever we cuz we we were uh, taking turns asking the questions whenever one of us will ask him about him being guilty or not or him doing what he was uh accused of he will cross his fingers put them in the back and say no i didn't <laughs> do it and then whenever you will ask him something else not related to guilt he will just relax and take his hands out and like just put them on his. It was so funny because it got to the point where we when, where we were asking the questions on purpose to see him do this. Yeah. And confirm that yes, he is doing that on purpose because I don't know. Legitimately crossing his crossing fingers. the fingers and putting them in the back so that we couldn't see it. Whenever he will say no, I didn't do it. Was and there then, like mental health issues with that guy? No, I mean, I don't, I don't know if. This is only like a Hispanic belief or not, like where you cross, cross oh, your fingers yeah. and you say a lie. That's a pretty common one. I don't yes. think that's unique to yeah. Hispanics. And but yeah. You get, I guess, saved or something. Matter of fact, they did that in the Willy Wonka thing. They, when they, she, she, He made them promise that I, you will not tell anybody about the everlasting exactly. gobstopper. Oh, yeah, and she crosses her leg. Agreed. Exactly. Little uh, Veruca salt. Yeah, so that was my that, my first experience. And I was like, 
okay, great. <laughs> this is, <You> know, <laughs> I will that, never forget this. <laughs> and that same, in that same jail, that same Robert Presley. Mm-hmm. Yes. That was the, the last time I was ever there to do a jail visit. That was, I told you about that story about that girl that started masturbating. Oh, oh God. <laughs> she, she was like, literally, she just started. And I'm like, hey, guards, <laughs> hey. <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> And it was one of these cases where they were literally, she was a uh, mental health and there were accusations of her malingering her because she was facing sexual assault charges okay. of like young boys. Yeah. And they were trying to determine whether or not she was competent to stand mm-hmm. trial. But the last time I saw her, she just straight up just started stripping and like masturbating. And well, I never saw her again after that. It was the most bizarre. That's why I asked you if it was like a mental health case, because mm-hmm. I mean, they do those over there. No, um, no, it was, and he had not been there long um, when we went to visit him. But I do remember we needed the help of the guard for something, and it wasn't that easy to get like a hold of them. Like we had to like scream, I mean not scream, but like yell, like hey, like we need you because he needed to sign something. Yeah. So I can imagine in your situation, like hey, like <laughs> I mean, <fast>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, yes, it, it was. It was bizarre. One of the many uh, bizarre encounters I've had. So for this case Mm -hmm. with Madeline Soto, it's, you know, we all were familiar with the story. We may be doing this show prematurely because it hasn't matured. And we're going to probably have to follow up on this in like a month or two when everything, all the charges start falling into place. I suspect, here's what I suspect. If they're going to charge Jennifer, it's going to happen within the next couple of weeks if it goes beyond a couple of weeks then they don't have enough on her Mm -hmm. and they're never going to get enough on her unless you know certain things what they have right now is inconsistencies but inconsistencies doesn't equal guilt especially in cases where she may be suspected as the victim of something Mm -hmm. domestic violence sexual assault herself who knows and so there's too many unknowns but my prediction is she's either going to get charged within the next couple of weeks of something or she's not going to get charged at all. And then we're going to start hearing that how she was a victim of abuse and all of the reasons why this and that or, or whatever. I imagine, I mean, I don't know if there's, if she is actively going to the interrogation room with the officers. I don't know if that's happened yet. I assume, I have to assume that she has given them her cell phone and they've looked through it and there's nothing incriminating in there obviously but the network has to go much deeper because if you're distributing cp the question becomes you know i mean i don't the dark web or whatever but who had knowledge of these photographs and they didn't limit their yesterday in the press conference law enforcement did not limit the scope of the investigation to just Jennifer. Now, does that necessarily mean that anybody else is on the horizon? No, they just said, look, everything is possible, which is basically a way to say nothing. So lots of speculation. We're probably doing this prematurely. Yes. We're going to have to cover this in, in, in another week or two or so. But yeah, it is one of the most... <sighs> I can't really think of a guy that is more unsavory than Stephen Stearns. We talked about Christopher Watts. We've talked about we've read some really bad ones. But the the act of, and we don't know the extent mm-hmm. of the atrocities that was experienced by young Madeline. What she's had to endure and for how long she's had to endure and, you know, whether or not she really did want to escape into the woods because she wanted some kind of alternate reality because of, what she was going on at home, mom's failure to protect her from all of those things. I just did an episode a couple days ago and just basically, look, she's either guilty of having knowledge of the murder, Mm -hmm. but what this all kind of boils down to, if nothing else, it's failure to protect your child. At what point do you, are you allowed to stop ignoring red flags? And I caution the suggestion that, well, Maybe it's possible she didn't know anything. I just don't believe that with her abuse being so just to the extreme that there wouldn't have been some kind of indication in her emotional state, some kind of transformation that can't be explained by the entry into being a teenager that mom didn't notice anything. 
maybe she saw some strange things, but at the same time, what I've seen in a lot of cases where there's like a minor being abused, sexually abused by some step parent, is that mom does, doesn't want to believe it because that means also letting go of that relationship. And then yeah. maybe she was in denial, like, no, this this can't be happening or something like that. And maybe she saw, but decided to ignore it. Well, that's that's 100% a part of it. Maybe she got jealous because how dare you lead him on like that? You know, those kinds of I had a case cases. like that once. Uh, it was a dependency case where, oh, actually the girl did end up going with the stepfather and she had a, a, a dependency case because uh, Child Protective Services had gotten involved because mom was pretty much beating up the child because I guess the relationship had yeah. happened for many years. And instead of blaming the boyfriend, she will always blame her daughter saying that it was her fault because she was the one like being sexy and kind of, and of course she was in big trouble, <laughs> but it happens. There's women like that, that yeah. instead of like, I remember that during the, the consultation, somebody, cause I, I wasn't doing the consultation. I, I just got the keys for checking something else during the consultation. The person that did it told her like lady, like you need to understand that, the person that you need to be mad at is the stepfather, not your daughter. Yeah. Your daughter doesn't, it's not guilty. It's, <laughs> it's, it's alarming how common it is of a, a case profile that is mm -hmm. where, you know, daughter is being abused by stepdad and um, mom blames it on the child. It's just bizarre how common that is. Or decides to look away because... It will destroy her family yes. unit and all of her financial well-being and yes. all of her, her her house structure. And exactly. these are complicated cases. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'll, 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 here's the only thing that I'm 100% decided on. Mm -hmm. The story that Jennifer Soto has given on multiple occasions is 100% bullshit. And that's the only conclusion I could draw on it. So far, the question is, to what extent is she guilty of any of this? And that's the question that remains to be answered. So for Madeline Soto, for today's purposes anyway, this is a to be continued for sure. We're not finished with this case. I'm not sure when we're going to revisit it. It's probably going to be when something new breaks, when new charges happens or whatever. Maybe we'll do some trial prep stuff for this. But yeah, it's a, it's a wild case. For... All of you that have been listening now for about an hour, 25 minutes, hour and a half or so, we're about to go into the family law, family law after dark portion of the show. So if you're only here to listen to us rants about or, or go into the deep dive on Madeline Soto, number one, thank you so much for finding the show and listening this long. I would like to thank all of you out there because our show has experienced unprecedented growth for a number of different reasons, but we're approaching 10,000 subscribers. We're going to probably be there within a day or two, or maybe, I don't know, we might be there now for all I know, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's coming And Eliana had a contract that once we hit 10,000 subscribers, she was going to dye her hair like a uh, purple or something or red but then i found out that oh i do that all the time so well that's uh, not really no i don't do it all the time i did it once when i was i think 16 oh well okay so you're gonna be a uh, 30 30 30 something year old uh, yeah. attorney heading into court with purple hair yeah. or whatever color we said i forgot i was supposed to sing a mariachi song I didn't think we were going to get to 10,000 subscribers, well, honestly. I really didn't. <laughs> I really didn't. So I got to start looking for a uh, washable dye. <laughs> or dye. Well, here's the thing. Here's the deal that I will make with our subscribers. Mm. We can either stick to that initial 10,000 or we could double down and we could say that. 
postponed. If we hit like a hundred thousand subscribers, <laughs> then we'll give like a oh, I don't God. know. We'll see. No, we got to do something for the 10,000. Yes, we we got to be people of our word. Right. And so we shall be. But thank you so much for the Zawaki followers. I'm doing a live stream with him later today at three. We're going to talk about the Christopher Watts case and the Watts obsession. I'm doing a live stream with her tonight, like at six. Again, to talk about the Watts case. They wanted to talk about the cross exam I did oh, okay. that you couldn't attend. I know. I'm that sorry. I really needed you there for. <laughs> To post objections to me yes. because I was going all in on, I made Melissa cry. Mother duty calls. I know. So. Dominic was here. He's, he's like, Melissa's over here getting all teary eyed. And <laughs> I know you had your mother's duty and <laughs> understandable, but. We can do an, another day. We can do something similar. Oh, we will. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. On a different case. People really liked that style mm -hmm. of contact. But for now, for now, I think. That, I think that, I never get this part right. <laughs> I think it is time to bring in Purple Haze. Welcome everybody to our segment, Family Law After Dark, where we get into all the nitty gritty details of some of these family law cases we have out there. And we're going to have a special shout out to one of our brand new subscribers. She wanted us to opine on her family law situation. So this is uh, Terry. Mm -hmm. She is a uh, grandmother uh, to, uh, we won't put this up on there. I don't put anybody's information in there. She is a grandmother to this child and she has a daughter who is 30 years old. Has always lived with us, had a casual two month relationship with the guy and got pregnant. Well, isn't that always the way? A few days after finding out, uh, she also found out that he cheated on her, so they broke up. He never spent any of the pregnancy with my daughter. They never married, obviously, and upon delivering my granddaughter, he was not at the birth, and his name was not added to the birth certificate. Basically, there was no contact during the pregnancy other than threats, crazy calls, and messages. We are a very united family and are helping her raise the baby, and although we and our daughter are tight with money, we are making this work with no child support from dad. Good for you. Now, about the baby's father, he rarely has a job, doesn't have a vehicle, just before the breakup, which was inevitable. My daughter found out he has a serious porn addiction. Uh, he also has a gambling addiction, as it is addicted to weed. Additional information is, after the breakup, because of his mental instability, it was discovered from his mom that he has a schizoaffective disorder and bipolar he doesn't follow through with his treatment, and even when he does, it is, no, it is known that his meds are not to be combined with marijuana. And I got a lot of cases like that, don't yeah. you? Um, he's been institutionalized before, has delusions, and has attempted suicide. We don't want him to have contact with the baby. Well, he sounds like a real winner. Um, his mother eventually got to my daughter and convinced her to allow him to visit when the baby was five months old. But... In the three times he came, all he wanted was to rekindle the relationship with my daughter and offered no financial help. Upon rejection, he got scary and no contact was implemented again. His mother enabled, enables his drug use, and we have cut contact with her as well. I assume he hasn't done a paternity test because he doesn't want to complicate things and possibly have to pay child support. He also claims to not be the father at times. Of course he does. Of so course. he's all over the place. Yes. <laughs> so my question is, does he have custody rights out of wedlock he most assuredly does and not being on the birth certificate and we live in miami florida for reference my daughter has also has all the receipts proving he is unfit to be a father um, also she fears he will want custody if anything she sh should happen to her and wants to leave a will or a testament type document leaving the custody of the baby that's not how that works yeah. um, can you advise on what documents she needs and how to go about it so i can't give you too much detailed advice because i'm not a florida attorney mm -hmm. but i can speak in generalities and i can relate it back to california law so there's a lot going on with that so first of all most states, and I suspect Florida is similar with that, but they will operate under the best interest of the child, which includes their safety. So to the extent that this person is a danger to himself, to others, it sounds like you may have gotten a restraining order against him already. 
maybe on more than one occasion, to the extent that he is a danger to the child, he should not have any visitation with the child that isn't supervised. Now, you mentioned a number of different things. So, I mean, if he's really schizophrenic, I've never heard the term that you had used, a schizoaffected, schizoaffective disorder. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard it, but I don't remember what it means. Schizoaffective. Well, since I'm on the internet. Google it. Schizoaffective, a mental disorder that is marked by a combination of schizophrenia, schizophrenia symptoms such as hallucinations or delusions. Yeah. So it's similar, very similar. And you're, you're right about if he's on medication, marijuana is certainly going to mm -hmm. affect that. I have a client that is very in a similar position as your daughter. So almost to a T. Now, her, ch her children are older now. Uh, but when the, the same thing, dating for a couple of months, ended up getting pregnant. The guy was like crazy, um, didn't have any job prospects. He still lives with his mom who is very much enabling a lot of his addictive behavior. Matter of fact, during the court appearances, uh, when we were uh, litigating that case, um, he would oftentimes just not show up. And then, well, the judge would be so kind as to call him at house at his house, just in case, because it was a serious custodial hearing and he wanted to cover all bases. Mm -hmm. And as we would call him over the loudspeaker in the court, he would just literally just be waking up. Oh, I didn't know I had court today. And, oh my. and rather than just make the orders that we're requesting, the judge would continue it because oh, he wanted, it was one, one of those. those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so frustrating. So, yes, the, the main points in that case was the safety of the child. Look, we're not trying to separate a father from child. It was, it was the main point that we had drove, drove home. It's just that out of safety concerns, this guy is dangerous. He is not safe to himself. He's got substance abuse issues. Never mind the support aspect of it. I don't imagine that mm -hmm. you guys believe that you're ever going to recover any exactly. child support from him, <laughs> uh, which you'd be correct in that. You're probably not. Not ever. Not ever. But uh, I lost my place. Does he have rights? He does. So what it would look like is probably something like this. He hires an attorney because his family or his mom is making him. And ask for some kind of a step up plan like, well, listen, I want to have some contact with my daughter. Yes, I have. Uh, and he's probably going to end up asking for 50 50 because everybody does, you know, some week on week off scenario. He's not going to get that because of status quo. How long did she say that they had that? Oh, five months old. Yeah. Oh, he's going to ask for a genetic testing. Well, I'm sure that that's probably coming paternity test. We could do all of those things. Regardless of what he, regardless of his malfeasance, regardless of all of the things that you said, that's still the child's father. Mm -hmm. And he has parental rights. Even if he has not uh, signed the birth certificate, we'll just do paternity tests. But here's the thing. If you don't ever file for child support, he's not going to feel the need to do mm -hmm. all of that. Exactly. Because in most states, they base child support in part on the percentage of time that the non-custodial parent spends with the child. And right now that figure is 0%. And you're not getting any money from him anyway. Exactly. So likely, <laughs> yeah, if, if, you, if you don't ask for child support, he's likely to just be gone. Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's no orders that say that you have to turn your child over to him. And if you think he's a danger, I would even say that you have a duty not to turn your child over to him because of whatever might be. Uh, I will say this, however, if he is not indeed schizophrenic if he doesn't indeed have a substance abuse issues mm -hmm. and you don't have all of the evidence to support those claims and he's really just you know it's a bad breakup and, and i'm not saying that it is but let's just say that he presents in court as a perfectly well-adjusted person mm -hmm. he doesn't fail any drug tests and he has a clean bill of health in terms of his mental health records then he's entitled to the same rights as every other parent regardless of what your opinions are of him all of those things may be proven in court Nobody likes the other parent when they get separated, especially as early as this one, especially in the way that it happened. This is not even like we built up like five to eight to 10 to 15 years of goodwill, having this, you know, building memories together. This was like a two month thing mm -hmm. that ended in the worst way possible with a child. And so here we are. If he ever lowers up, I promise you, he's going to come for a portion of custody and visitation. You can't stop that. But what you can maybe not do is incite it by filing for child yes. support and good on your daughter for and, and you for your help in 
basically buckling down and saying, we're going to take care of this child. We don't need him and all that kind of stuff. Now, I forgot what the context was about that one time. Oh, yeah. Grandma got involved and said that, spoke to her daughter. Oh, yes. And said that, you know, we got to have some contact. So I assume that this guy wants nothing to do with that child. But his mom is making him. But here's the thing. In most states, certainly in California, grandparents really don't have many rights at all. There's no child custody and visitation for the grandparents. There's limited exceptions, Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not, that's, they they don't apply. That's another subject. (laughs) Yeah. You don't have to bend to her claims. She can't file for custody for him. Again, the scenario where she financially helps him and makes him do that, maybe that's coming. But at that point, if he's not motivated himself to want to be a part of this child's life, then I imagine that you're going to make an easy time of it in court by demonstrating all of the things that you said. And at that point, if they issue visitation in California, I'll tell you what it would look like. He'd probably have vis- supervised visitations, maybe by a professional monitor, which he's not going to be able to afford, or by some non-professional that you guys pre-approved. That's how it works in California. Again, I don't know how it works in Florida, mm-hmm. but that's, I imagine what he is looking at if any of those things are provable. And there's going to be also special considerations because a child of five months old is probably still breastfeeding, Mm -hmm. probably has a pretty set sleep schedule, like naps every two hours or whatnot, probably wakes up every two hours at night. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like, oh, you're just going to spend a week with dad and you don't have (laughs) only that set up. So what that means is for now, there might be some visitation time. And as the child ages and gets older and is less cumbersome to watch because there's less medical concerns and, you know, the child is going to be healthy. Then we start transitioning into a more traditional parenting schedule that will depend on the, you know, the party's work schedules Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But we're a long way from Zion, as they say. Do they say that? I don't know. I just made it up. (laughs) So here's the deal. This is a very, we're very early in it all early in all of this Mm -hmm. and a lot of this talk is premature but it's good to talk about because you got to know what you're facing and what you're facing is right now if he wants to be a deadbeat then let him exactly i don't know how old he is but your daughter's 30 i'd imagine he's somewhere uh, close to that age and i've mentioned on my last show the last family law segment that we were talking about a guy similar to this I don't know if he had any of the mental health issues but he was like 35 and there was no it was like a 10 year plus relationship and he had never changed and I said well he's never going to change so and there's no way for us or the court to make him change (laughs) yeah we can't force him to be a good dad we could give him the opportunity and nothing more Mm -hmm. and so for now I would say the last thing you want to do is file for child support because you're just kicking the hornet's nest leave it alone but I'll tell you what you're going to have to contend with grandma she's going to be chirping at you She's going to be mm-hmm. chirping at your daughter. She's going to be in this guy's ear. And she is probably far more invested in all of yes. this than her son. And Love so, grandma. yeah, because of her, <laughs> which, you know, it happens a lot. You don't have to bend to her whims. You don't have to bend to her demands. You don't have any legal obligation to make your baby have time with grandma. Dad might be a different story, but he's not the one asking. Plus, if you think that he's a danger to the child, you got to make sure that there's precautions. So you don't want to cut him off altogether and just say, no, you're never going to see him again because that's, you know, courts will look, will frown mm-hmm. upon that. But it could be something like, okay, you can, but all of these people have to be here and it has to be at our place and we're going to take these protectionary measures. And then when the judge asks, well, why did you do all of that? Well, because he's a schizophrenic mm-hmm. drug addict. And he's made all these crazy threats and I had to get a restraining order on him. It's like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And then you're safe or, or you know, you're, you're welcome to do those things. So that's really what I have to say about this scenario. Do you have anything to add to that, Ileana? I mean, just in general, because I know this comes up a lot, at least in my consultations. And I mean, I just want to be blunt and it doesn't matter if, father was there or not during the pregnancy that does not have any effect when it comes to getting a visitation or custody or anything like that and also when it comes to the grandma getting involved the mother of the child has no um obligation to communicate with her i know it might be rude but you can just block her if the father 
or let, let your father really wants to be involved, he is the one that needs to. Again, He's the one going to step you. up. Yeah. So yeah, grandma can just, I don't know, kick and scream, but she has no place in this, unfortunately. None. If if her, if the dad came to me as, mm-hmm. as a client and said he wanted custody, this is what I would tell him. Uh, basically, if you, I, I want to have all your mental health records, mm-hmm. You cannot be on any substances. I'm going to volunteer you for surprise random drug tests to assuage the court's concerns of any substance abuse. We're going to make sure that you have a clean bill of mental health. If you have any issues, I want to know his criminal records. I got to get all that squared away. But before we do all of that, just be realistic. If you want your child, you're going to have to do all of these things. Again, giving him the opportunity to step up and be a dad. I can't make him. I can't be the daddy for him. He's gonna. That's 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 something that he's got to handle on his own. And he either will or he won't. There's been clients where I've put together a plan for them like that, and they just well, they didn't go well. Yeah. And it was never gonna go well. I literally had a few weeks ago a client. His mom brought him into my office. That's a red flag. Yeah, and she was doing all the talking. And he was sitting there and he had, you know, maybe five words to say. And then at the hearing, he was present on the telephone. Okay. And he fell asleep. Oh, my goodness. You could hear him. You could hear him snoring. As the court called our case, I dropped him from the call. Oh, my goodness. And I, I finished up his hearing and. After that, he didn't call me back. I can't imagine why. <laughs> oh my god! We had to try, like, try to track him down. On on a recent visit that I did to I did to Orange County Court, I remember entering the the courtroom, and in that courtroom they had like this, what do you call it? like projector screen? Yes. And you could see like the people that were appearing via Zoom, and one of the counsel was completely asleep, like. This, <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> nobody's saying anything to him, but yeah, yeah, it happens. <laughs> I've I've never done that one personally, but and it was a first when my client was asleep. Uh, but you know, it just demonstrated his. Oh, now that I just remember, I once appeared to a DCSS case. He was via Zoom, in well, LA Court Connect, yes. LA, and this guy, I don't know. If he understood, like everybody could see him, he was changing clothes. <laughs> okay. He had just woken up. He placed a camera. You could see him from his waist up, but you could see that he was like taking his, the movement of taking his pants. Lawyer? Uh, lawyer? No. Not oh, a lawyer. Okay. Lawyer. Appropriate. And then put it. No, but he had a lawyer that oh. he was connected. And I was like, is the his attorney going to say something? No. He completely changed his pants. You could see him walking to the corner and washing his face and his teeth. And then coming back and then uh, kind of like, like he had just woken up and I was like, oh my God, like, no, (laughs) I I wanted to scream. (laughs) You know, there's a lot of those videos on like TikTok and YouTube about these Mm -hmm. people that are making these crazy court appearances on Zoom. Remember there's like one lawyer, like his face was a parrot. It was a cat or something. Your Honor, I'm not a cat. I'm not a cat. I I love that one. No, but... It was after that I and I was like I thought I was never gonna see something like this, but yeah, I could see, you could see his pants that he did this and yeah. they flew and like yes, you just changed your pants. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! <sighs> Folks, you gotta present well in court, man. Please. I mean, at the very least, keep it together for your five minute court mm-hmm. appearance. Just, I mean, you know, I digress. We should move on. <laughs> Thank you, Terry, for your submission. Uh, much appreciated. I hope everything is well. And thank you so much for uh, being a listener, su- subscribing to our show. Mm-hmm. I hope I did you proud with my analysis. Um, next one. So legally, can you use something your spouse did 10 plus years ago before the divorce in court? Hmm. For what purpose? Mm-hmm. So I have a friend whose husband is trying to get her in legal trouble for allegedly buying a firearm for him when he was a convicted felon. Is it usable in court? The state in question is Kentucky. Also, isn't there a law that prohibits your spouse from using past situation or she's talking about marriage, the the marital privilege, privilege. using past situations or things from your marriage and the divorce? 
But yeah, but she holds the privilege. If she wants to testify, she can. Exactly. She just can't be forced to. If so, I think it's also limited as to what she's told, not necessarily what she saw. Yeah, so I'm going to answer this in terms of federal yeah. law because mm-hmm. I'm not a, a Kentucky attorney. So this is very general advice. You still, you got to consult with a Kentucky lawyer mm-hmm. on this. But the question is, for what purpose do you think that that's going to be relevant yeah. in your divorce? What are you trying to do? And generally, well, I'll give you an example. In the state of California, anything that happened like five years prior as relates to domestic violence, at least, is usually not relevant. Mm-hmm. It's just too much passage of time unless there's a very specific re- reason, like it's a directly connected to some more recent mm-hmm. occurrence, right? Is that the end of the question? What is it? Oh, so you're talking about marital privilege. So marital privilege, let's look at it together. Marital privilege in federal so under the federal rules of evidence in a criminal case the prosecution cannot compel the defendant's spouse to testify against him and this privilege only applies if the defendant and the spouse witness are currently married at the time of prosecution so number one it doesn't apply in family court And the only space that I could see that really even being relevant is in criminal court. Like, again, what are you trying to prove? I guess is my question. Like, what do you think you're going to get out of this from the divorce? Unless it's like a... I'm saying this is a piece of... Yeah. Is it like a custody issue? You want to prove he's a bad dad? Look, people get... they People have rap sheets. Most people have a rap sheet. Most people have done stuff you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, there's there's not a whole lot of people out there walking around with a completely squeaky clean mm-hmm. rap sheet. Whether it's you know, reckless driving, you got a DUI in your past, have you been speeding, you got a bad driving record, uh, suspension of a license as a misdemeanor, you know, battery and assault from when you got in a fight at the club when you were like 22 years old that I'm ta- not talking about me but uh, you know people have lots of people have lots of crimes um, from their past they don't get to be held accountable for it mm-hmm. forever it has to be relevant to your situation so again I don't know in what context you mean that they're you're trying to use this information in court I could just tell you from a child custody perspective it's not going to be relevant because it was mm-hmm. over 10 years ago in a domestic violence situation where you're trying to prove a restraining order, it's not recent enough. Mm-hmm. You, you need more recent, more recent instances of uh, domestic violence for a court to do anything related to like a restraining order or something mm-hmm. like that. And so your question is fairly ambiguous, but the marital privilege is something that happens in criminal court. They can't make your wife, your current wife, not your divorce, not your ex-wife. They can't make your current wife testify against you, but she can if she wants to. That's how it works. That's all I really have to say about that one. Oh, the last question. The child of the wife does not wish to stay with the dad. Okay, it was about a custody thing. (laughs) the The children of the wife do not wish to stay with the dad because they are scared of him and he has had multiple outbursts resulting in destruction of property before and after the divorce. Is that enough of a reason for file to file for removal of mandatory? But no, it's not unless I need more information. But the fact that I just find it compelling that the one thing you want to bring up is a conviction that may yeah. have happened or something that happened over 10 years ago. Yeah. You could just rely if he's doing that, if he's having these multiple outbursts and it happened recently, just use that. That's enough. Mm-hmm. If a guy's acting like a maniac and he's scaring the children, then, then focus on that. But yeah, 10 year old crimes. Oh, I, I would not, I would not relate to that. That reminds me. I once had a case where there was a domestic violence incident. There were no charges or anything like that. The parties after that had three children, lasted like 12 years together. And then during the divorce, mom wanted to use that incident as a reason to not allow the children to be around father. Yeah. I'm like, lady, you had three <laughs> children with him after that incident. Right. Maybe you shouldn't have the child. You should not have had the children that. Yeah are involved in visitation right now if you yeah. really thought he was a danger so <laughs> it is such the nature of divorce that oh i'm just gonna bring up all of his all yes. of his 
all of his stuff and we're just going to air it all out, you know, and because of that, he should not ever be around the children. It's and what just, surprised uh, me is that he, she was represented. I was like, this attorney had the audacity to bring up. Newer attorney? No. Really? Yes. Really? He could have been my dad. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, doesn't he know the rule? <laughs> oh, maybe he was like a tax attorney or something, taking on a family law case. You never maybe. Know. That, that I really didn't research him, so... Maybe he needed the money. <laughs> so, this next one comes to us. It's kind of long, so let me just... I'm going to get into... I'm not really sure what the gist of this is, but so they say... So I filed... It's titled Bad Divorce Advice, so I'm curious. So it says, I filed for divorce from my emotionally abusive, high-powered surgeon husband a few months ago. Oh, this one's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. That intro. <laughs> I'm a, what is a S-A-H-M? Stay at home mom. Oh, stay at home mom to a toddler who put her life on hold for five years to move all over the country with him to finish his training. Then later to raise our baby. In retrospect, he'd been emotionally terrorizing me for a while. I would often joke that I can't say no to him, but I seriously, seriously, I couldn't say no to him because... He had me so trained and afraid. Since filing for divorce, it's been amicable between us, I think partly on the advice of his lawyer. Yeah, probably. And partly so he can act like I'm the crazy one. And I, I wonder if she played right into that. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that's one of my advice to my client. Look, whatever it is that you're doing or saying, knock it off. Mm -hmm. You need to behave. And if you feel the need to text her some crazy ass text message, then you text me first exactly, and get it out of your system. And I'm going to tell you, you probably shouldn't send that and then we'll be okay. And it works. And so they yeah. start behaving. But I always say, look, if they're going to be crazy like that, just make sure they put it in writing and text messages. Yes. And now we can just show the judge, your honor, look at all the stuff that we're dealing with. I mean, it depends on what context it would be relevant, but it's a tactic mm -hmm. in, it is. in the family law tool book. Where was I at? Okay, so, but difficult to continue to stay at home mom while looking for a job with this giant gap on a shoestring budget so it doesn't look like I'm wastefully spending. Plus, kids started a Mother's Day Out program two days a week, and we've been sick on and off the entire time. Spent Thanksgiving quarantine with covid not the most fun, but honestly, I feel emotionally and even physically so much better away from him. She's talking about COVID, but she's all, she's saying that this is bad advice that she got. So I'm kind of waiting for the punchline here. Yeah, it's like I'm, I'm yeah. I never, I never realized how much he undermined me, all the constant criticism, denial, nitpicking. I'm tired now, but man, I was so tired before, before doing everything I'm doing now. By the way, this is like such, <laughs> this is such. This is kind of how our family law consults go. We get like all of the story and we're kind of like waiting we're for like, it. <laughs> at least I don't know about you, but when I'm doing them on the phone, I'm like, yes, okay, like go on, like speed it up. Like, I just want to know the, the details. Yeah, of I don't cut them off because, you yeah, know, exactly. I, I don't either. But you can if you if they were to see me, they could see. Yeah, I'm this. literally just trying to pick out the relevant things yes. that they're saying and build the thing, you know. But OK, so all that to say, I'm actually doing pretty effing great. Okay. Most people who haven't seen me in a while comment how good I look, how happy, how I'm more like my old self. Good. Most people, except for an old friend of mine who's been divorced a couple of times, who recently told me over lunch to reconcile if at all possible. Okay. But this has to... <laughs> I don't know, but this is... <laughs> Sounds like a journal entry instead yeah. of... Yeah. So she says, you think it's hard now. She said, it only gets harder. Worse, more awful. Run from singledom. She wishes she was still married to her first husband. That sounds like a her problem. Yeah. Uh, despite being in a serious relationship for the past year and a half, like they live together and are building a house together, to say I was shocked is an understatement. She doesn't have kids, so I don't know what she that she realizes how busy I am and how long a priority dating or like ever seeing... Is this how your conversations go with like your girlfriends about like how you like give yourself like the big journal entry or like like the whole psychological profile about how great of a person you are and I'm you know no but I was gonna say like without you finishing it my mind was going like she just needs a friends to talk to yeah this, like, well, like and then she decided to post this on Reddit I guess. 
This reminds me of an attorney that, did I tell him about that guy that came to my office? Is like, I'm one of yeah. the best attorneys. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, when people start like self-promoting mm-hmm. like that, it's red flags. Yeah. Okay. Also, I'm doing a lot of therapy to make myself as well as it can be for myself and my kids to unlearn, unhear the abuse. But still, it was really jarring to have someone basically say, turn back. You're effing up. When the feedback I've gotten from my therapist, my friends, my family has all been, you're doing great. This is hard and you're killing it. You're stronger than you know. I'm seriously considering ending our friendship over this. I would know it was probably more than about her own issues, but it felt so draining and terrible to spend of some of my precious free time with her hearing that. And yet the scared part of me, the part used to listening to him wonders if I'm making a mistake. Cut that supposed friend off. And if you ever want to get back to your ex, you can always do it afterwards. <laughs> like this is just a rant. Well, it was a big rant. Yeah. But the first thing in her first sentence was she said, emotionally abusive, high powered surgeon husband. All right. So successful. I guess. Makes a lot of money, I'm assuming. I don't know. You want to go back to an an emotionally abusive man? I'll tell you what's going to happen if you go back to this guy. Successful men are on average, on average, with exceptions, a lot of them, Mm -hmm. full of themselves. And if you were describing this man as emotionally abusive, I don't know how you define emotionally abusive, Mm -hmm. but I imagine I know what it looks like. That you were lucky to be in his presence. You were lucky to be sharing his income with him in the marriage, that he was this successful, high-powered surgeon saving lives, and you were a stay-at-home mom that couldn't even keep the house clean or the, the food cooked or do the laundry. And you probably, did she say she had kids? I don't think so. Oh, yes, the toddler. Yeah, later raised the baby. Yes, so stay-at-home mom. your body changed, mm-hmm. and he probably had stuff to say about that. And furthermore, because he's a successful man, options abundant. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have to be that nice to you because he wasn't all that invested in to begin with. You were a a stopgap, a go-between. You were a a convenience. I don't know. But he didn't have much incentive to be nice to you. And if that's the emotional abuse that you're talking about, I know what that looks like. I am... I don't know anybody like this that I consider a friend, but I have a lot of cases like this where it's very common. You get these people and they think that, oh, and it's, it's unique to medical professionals. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's funny because I, I think it's like this whole dynamic is I am literally saving lives. Like, you know, people yeah. say that all the time. But look, if I do not sew together your body, you are going to be dead, mm-hmm. you know? And I should just, you know, they, they have like this weird God complex. And so this guy, I could imagine this is what she's talking about. Do you want to go back to that? If you go crawling back to that man, it's going to be five times worse. I promise you. There is yeah. nothing left for you with that man. He is the father of your child. Collect the support. Collect mm-hmm. the alimony if it was awarded to you. And move on with your life. If you look great and you're doing all these wonderful things, you don't need anybody's validation. You don't need your friend's validation. Who gives an S what your friend has to say about it? You're the one living your life. Raise your child. Go out and uh, live and be merry. Mm-hmm. Not married. Be merry. Be happy. <laughs> be happy. Don't be so insecure. Don't look to validate yourself yes. with your friends so much. Who gives a shit what she thinks? Change friends. Yeah. And don't just because this guy's a surgeon think that, you know, the only reason you're considering going back with him I imagine, as this other person, mm-hmm. who's probably had a similar person. Interesting, she says she's building a whole life with another guy, year and a half, buying a house together. She still wants to go back with her ex. I don't know what that's, that's about. Mm. I don't care. But she's probably looking at your ex thinking, oh, high-powered surgeon. Yeah. You know who used to think about like that? Women in like a, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, 50s, until the 60s, mm-hmm. and then the, the, the hippie generation, yes. and then, you know, feminist movements and then there's been it's, it's just been look that's old that, that's a hundred that that's a hundred to two hundred year old thinking 
I would hope that you could advance beyond that. And I'm really not going to say more on it than that. Do you got any parting words for this lady, Eliana? Dominic, what do you say to this lady? <laughs> Ileana, closing closing thoughts with her. Change friends and <clears throat> finish that divorce. That's it. Yes. All right. <laughs> Before I get myself in trouble, I'm gonna move <laughs> off of this topic. Okay, so this guy sought legal advice on Reddit and publicly admits to crimes, and he's now oh, trying no. to subpoena users who have a, gave legal advice and annoyed that and annoyed that public admittance was used against them. I think this is something they, they more want to share as opposed to something that's asking advice. But the post says, so I made a Reddit post on this sub, and please charge me. It says, hi, all. As the title suggests, I made a post on this sub a while back. I guess admitting to some things and took the advice from some of you saying to drag it out and then they're not guilty and so forth. And the mod locked my post and said it was off topic, but then I was DMing people who commented on my post and they guided me through the process. I used some of the comments and advice to guide my own decisions in my legal case. And now I was subject to a police raid on my home unit and my computer phones and other items was seized and police have used my confessions on my Reddit post as ammunition <laughs> in my ongoing court case. Oh, yes. My legal aid advisor who dropped out because I now no longer satisfy the means testing said that I can subpoena people who gave me advice on this sub. Does anyone know the process? For what? To subpoena folks. Yeah, it's a form that you got to fill out. No, no, I know, but yeah. why do you want to subpoena them? Like, what? how are they going to help I know. Them? Why did you give me that advice? Yes. You made me do something stupid. You tricked me. Exactly. Do you want like, to further the, the embarrassment, dumbass? <laughs> like, what's the purpose? I don't get it. Okay, look, don't... Well, I can understand now with that question why he ended up in Reddit doing a confession. So, yeah, he's just dumb. How about no seek legal advice on Reddit yeah. from people that are unverified attorneys and just, like, talking shit probably? Like, I imagine he probably posted something stupid. And was like, okay, let me tell you, this is what you do. <laughs> it's like um, you got to do this, this, and that, and they're basically trolling him. It's like, oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe they give him some like sovereign citizen. Hey, just it's challenge sovereign. jurisdiction. <laughs> just tell them that they haven't oh, proved okay. jurisdiction because it's not an admiralty court or uh, commonwealth court. It's totally gonna work. It works so well for Daryl Brooks. <laughs> no, here's what you should do. You should say that they haven't named a victim, and that we need the there victim present. That's that's definitely what you should do. <laughs> I don't know. How about just don't be a dumbass and get random advice from Reddit yes. and actually follow it? Hey, there's lots of attorneys out there that give free legal advice. Mm -hmm. I, from time to time, I will give free legal advice, um, especially if I don't think that they need an attorney. I think mm -hmm. they can do them. So look, you'll be fine. Just do this. I mean, it'll be, you, you, you spread a lot of goodwill that way. There's lots of attorneys out there. It's not just me. I know yeah. Ileana does that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm sorry, guy. I don't think the subpoenas are going to help you, <laughs> but I'm sure if you go down to the legal aid office, they'll show you the forms that you need to fill out. Yeah. And I'll just leave that one at that. Divorce question. We got time for maybe one more or two more. Uh, Which one you want to do? There's a divorce question or uh, bad divorce advice. Let's do one because I'm hungry. And oh, I ordered you question. sandwiches. You, you did? Out. Yeah. Oh, did I do this one? Yeah, that's oh, then we'll do the other one. Oh, yeah, because the bad divorce was the rent. Yeah. Let me just make sure that they are not trying to deliver food. And Liana, I told you I was going to have food for you this morning. And they were supposed Yay. to be here at like <laughs> 10, and they are not. Oh. I can't do anything about it. At 10, it's 120. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness all right so we'll do one more You're playing with my emotions <laughs> I, I i i came into this with the best of intentions oh god all right so currently going through a divorce and attempting to just represent myself my husband filed not me we have no kids we have some debt and own a home so it's just selling the house and dividing that up he has an attorney if need be, I'll figure out a way to get one, but I'd rather not. I understand. 
so my question is this. He has been threatening to make me repay money that he's spent. For the past two years, paying our bills, expenses. Long story short, I was the breadwinner. I resigned from my position for personal reasons. I currently roll. My current role pays less, so I'm not able to contribute as much as I used to. My husband's salary increased, but he can't stand that he's putting in more money than me. And after two years, he's divorcing me over it. It's fine and his choice, but I just need to know if I'm going to be dealing with a judge entertaining him going back for two years and saying, see, I bought $200 worth of groceries. She owes me half. No. <laughs> no. All right. So in a community <laughs> property state, any money that was spent, any money that was uh, earned, um, any debts that were incurred are the assets of both parties. Mm -hmm. You split it down the middle. Every dollar that you make is 50 cents yours or hers with utter disregard to who the breadwinner is, whether that was you or him. Uh, with utter disregard to any fluctuations in income. You guys are a team. The law sees you that way. Yeah. It's the basis of many Marvin lawsuits. Palimony. Mm -hmm. But if you were just paying the bills, you don't get reimbursed mm -hmm. for that in a community property state. There are exceptions. There are things you can mm -hmm. get reimbursed yes, for. Yes, there's some things, but... What would those be, Eliana, super well, lawyer? <laughs> one of them is going to be if they use money to pay for student loans and yes. there, there was like the no benefit to the community if they use any personal property to maybe pay community debts depending on how that happened and what else well i'll give you the general rule so the general rule mm -hmm. is if you make a separate property contribution to the community, you are entitled to a dollar for dollar reimbursement. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? If you got an inheritance from, what's that movie with the dead guy where they were propping him up? Mm -hmm. You guys wouldn't know, it's from the 80s. <laughs> dead Harry or something, or Weekend at Bernie's. Weekend at Bernie's? Never mind. It's literally a movie of a guy that was dead and they were just like parading him over town for like a weekend okay. trying to pretend he was living. It was stupid. Where, where am I going with this? Oh, if you get an inheritance from mm -hmm. somebody, um, like your willed money from a relative, mm -hmm. that is your separate property income. And if you keep that in a separate account that only belongs to you mm -hmm. and you don't commingle that or put it in the joint account or do mm -hmm. some other stupid thing that causes it to change its character, that is going to be your separate property money. So let's just say that it was $500,000 mm -hmm. that you got from old Aunt Burgett and <laughs> from Breaking Bad. Um, the, the tax money scenario. Never mind. Some of you guys are going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. My husband watched that show. I watched just parts of it. I've watched it like front to back all seven seasons, like probably four or I five times. I liked it. It's just that it was a little bit too gruesome. So whenever they really they were, like the scenes where they're like cutting fingers and stuff like that, I would just walk away. And then, of course, I missed like <laughs> half of the series because half of the series was that <laughs> just cutting people off. Well, Eliana, sometimes you just got to grow a pair. Yeah. <laughs> I like <laughs> Better Call Saul. <laughs> no. I watched that one too. But going back to my old Aunt Burgett scenario, okay, so you've been gifted mm -hmm. $500,000 from an inheritance. That's your separate property money. You've opened up a separate account only in your name. That money stands as your separate property, meaning your husband or your wife or your partner gets zero dollars of it. But then you take that five hundred thousand dollars and you use it on a, as a down payment on a one point two million dollar home. That house acquired during marriage is community property. However, you are entitled in the event of a divorce to a dollar for dollar mm -hmm. reimbursement um, of you, you get your five hundred thousand dollars back, That's and then you guys split whatever's left. Yeah. So. You will get reimbursed in that that way, but if it's, you're just talking about you earning an income and he's earning an income, and you guys are using that income to pay bills. Nobody's getting reimbursed for shit. Nope. That is a that is a, that number one. That those bills belong to both of you. Doesn't matter whose name it was in. The debts that you guys have belong to both of you. The the example that Eliana used about student loans, mm -hmm. the law is basically that student loans is not community property. That's your deal. You're paying it. By the way, you know that Biden is going to be forgiving like another $6 billion yeah. of student loans. I don't think it's going to apply to any of us. Mm -hmm. Last time it didn't matter. No. Some, But some small amount, you're getting a some kind of a discount on student loans. 
But yeah, as long as you did not, well, put it this way, as long as he did not contribute his separate property assets to the community, you don't have to reimburse him for anything. And you should sleep well. I will advise you that it's not advisable to have him have an attorney and you guys are going to be mm-hmm. litigating this issue and you're just going to be doing this yourself. The law is on your side. I'm just saying that um, just because law is on your side doesn't mean that you're going to be able to, to perform this in mm-hmm. litigation. Exactly. You might at the very least want to get a consult, something more than this one, because they're going to go over specifics with you and all of that stuff. But you're probably safe. And I will end, I will end it with that. So, Ileana, what do you think about the 10,000 subscriber thing? Pretty excited about that. I haven't checked. I know. I don't know if it's changed in the last hour, but. We were at 97.11. 97.11. So maybe this this, this video will be the thing that pushes us Mm -hmm. over the threshold. Oh. All right. If if, if we end up uh, hitting 10,000, we're going to end up doing a a special 10,000 mm-hmm. subscriber episode in the midst of a bottle of wine with my wife. I texted Ileana and I said, Hey, we're going to be doing the 10,000 subscriber episode from a karaoke bar. And I was going to be performing Sabor a me or some other crazy oh song. <laughs> no, when I saw the text, I was like, Okay. (laughs) And I said, hey, we're going to a karaoke bar. Bring your husband. Yes. I don't think neither. I'm thinking back. I don't think I have ever done karaoke. I'll just tell you this. If I, if we do this and your husband comes and I do my, I fulfill my promise Mm -hmm. to sing a mariachi karaoke song, your husband is going to get up on stage with me. I don't think I ever seen him doing karaoke. For a good reason, probably. There's yeah. a reason why you've never seen me do it. But oh, I'm going to do it anyway. There's going to have to be significant copious amounts of yes. alcohol involved. Uh, I'm not doing this sober. There's no chance. He dances when he drinks. So oh, I, I, I dance all the time. I got it in my blood. Me and my wife, when we go out, we, we dance, man. We get out there. We make it happen. So, folks, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. Um, and if you have listened to the entire Madeline Soto mm-hmm. episode and uh, Family Law After Dark, oh, you are my favorites. I just want you to know that. Um, I'm starting to get to know so many of you. I, we have regular commenters mm-hmm. now. You know, we've done this show since 22, yes. the close of 22. It took us like a year and a half mm-hmm. to get to 1,700 subscribers. Mm-hmm. And now... In January, we did a show on the Natalia Gray series. We followed that with Gypsy Rose. We did this Christopher Watts thing. Mm-hmm. Now we're doing a, a Madeline Soto. And we have shot up to 10,000. I'll tell you what. We've been putting a lot of time and effort and work into the show. We're going to continue to do that. Dominic um, mm-hmm. has been a godsend for the show. He's yes. uh, the active producer of a long-form podcast. And so a lot of the credit goes to him. If... Uh, Dominic, I don't know what I'm doing, man. Um, how do I get this to fill up the whole screen? <laughs> you definitely gotta put you gotta put a shot of Dominic sitting in the <laughs> with you. Oh. Okay. That's funny. Should be good, but if you're gonna show anything that's not or not actually you could be able to change it. So yeah, you should be good now. Nah, just if uh, you want to contact him for your producing needs, Dominic, where could they get a hold of you? Uh, my email address is best. I'll have it on screen. He'll do something with the graphics <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, but contact him. He's, he's pretty good. But for all of that, we will see you guys next week when hopefully, hopefully, we're going to finally get into the Scott Peterson episode that we've been teasing now for like a couple of months. I know some of you are mad at me because... <laughs> Hasn't happened. Well, it was either this or Madeline Soto, and like 80% of the people wanted to do Madeline. It's like, all right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so we're covering it. Uh, but I promise, if um, unless something crazy happens, some reason okay. to not do it, we're going to do Scott Peterson next week on the long form. Other than that, um, although I'm going to be in Rosarito uh, for Monday to Thursday, I plan on trying at least uh, continue to do the uh, Tilted Lawyer daily segment that we've been doing. Mm-hmm. 
um, and carry on with that momentum. But for all of that, you guys, please stay safe. If you guys get in trouble, don't say anything to the cops. You're going to want to call us. <laughs> but, hey, we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.